What's up, everybody? Welcome to Assassin's Creed In Review, a kind of funny games in review special where I, Barrett Courtney, will be reviewing each major release in the Assassin's Creed franchise, spanning from the original all the way to Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and of course, ranking them as I go. If you're unfamiliar with me, I tweet things and direct shows for kind of funny, and last year, I did something similar with The Legend of Zelda. I played every major release, recorded my review of each one shortly after beating each game, and compiled it all into one in-review special. And I'm doing it all again this year with Assassin's Creed, but the major difference this time around, I won't be doing full-on story recaps. I did them with Zelda because I was obsessed with the complicated timeline stuff and fascinated how each game subtly connected to each other through their stories. And also that's because that's what an in-review is known for having but I'm cutting it this time around, so hopefully we aren't here for four hours. I'm fascinated to find out how long this one will be. But I'll still be having certified Barrett Courtney nerding out moments and bringing up characters and story beats when I feel the need to, so spoilers beware. Anyway, shortly after Zelda in Review, I got the itch to play another longer video game franchise, and Assassin's Creed quickly came to mind. No matter how often I forget, whenever a new game comes out in the franchise, I'm reminded just how big of a fan I am of the series. This is a series that has been important to my history with video games for roughly 10 years at this point, so I thought it'd be fun to go through and play the Assassin's Creed franchise again, and beat one or two of them for the first time. At first, I wasn't married to the idea of doing an in-review for this. I was originally just going to play through the franchise on my own to get hyped for Valhalla, but come on, it's me. I can't not make content out of this. So without further ado, let's review and rank the Assassin's Creed franchise one game at a time. First up, where it all began. Some facts for you before we review, the first game in the series originally released on November 13th, 2007 for the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 and was developed by Ubisoft Montreal. To give some context, I played the PC port because interestingly enough, the very first Assassin's Creed is the only one I cannot find available on the PS4. It might be on PS Now, but I didn't I didn't want to play a game on PS Now, let's be honest. And a fun fact for you that you should absolutely read more about if you don't know already, but Assassin's Creed was originally intended to be another Prince of Persia game back in 2003-2004 that eventually evolved into what we saw in 2007. I don't want to spend too much time on this fact, but seriously, go read about it because the history of this original game is really interesting. But we don't have time to discuss it here, we're here to review it, so let's get to the review. So the original Assassin's Creed sets up some great ideas and makes a solid foundation for its successors, but ultimately comes across more as a proof of concept than an actual game. The idea of learning about your targets and terrain to make your assassinations easier is cool, but feels half-baked because it seems to always end with a sword fight and a chaotic chase, or maybe I was just bad at assassinations. But to me, for the first entry in a series that is primarily about stealth, stealth feels like it took a weird backseat for the important parts of the ride. The the story and lore, however, starts off on the right foot and sets up the endless war between assassins and Templars in a really interesting way. Who's right? Who truly seeks freedom? And what does freedom really mean at the end of it all? The themes and questions laid out are intriguing and are only held back by some subpar voice acting from the characters in the past. Not fortune, skill. Watch a while longer and you might learn something. If this game did anything for me, it made me wish that the series throughout continued to lean into the who's right, who's wrong conversation. But again, not a lot of the characters themselves hit the same threshold of captivation. The one character that truly stood out was Al Mualim, and that's just because he was a cool villain and his reveal as the villain is still one of the best in the entire series. Everyone else... Yeah. I've been beating around the bush, but yes, even Altair was kind of lame in this one specifically. He's more of a vessel for the player rather than an actual character, which again, to me is good enough knowing that they were figuring out what AC should be with this one. So everyone besides the villain wasn't disappointing to me per se, I just don't think they're as interesting as people remember them being when the first game came out. On the other hand, while the modern day story sets up some cool lore for later, in the moment for just this game, it felt almost too thin to the point that I'm surprised it stayed in the game. Thankfully, it was for the best because the series expands on the modern day stuff in really cool ways quickly after this. My only other 
another major complaint from both stories is that they both end abruptly with no feeling of closure on either end. A bold move for a first entry which ultimately paid off in the sequel, but it definitely did not feel satisfying just within the context of its own game. Ultimately, I, I don't really have much to say about this game, and that's because I don't really feel like there's a lot here. I enjoyed my time with this game solely for the purpose of re-experiencing how the story all began, but with the half-baked gameplay and open-world activities like helping citizens to create hiding places, take a back seat very quickly after this, which tells me even the team at Ubisoft knew that these activities alone weren't engaging enough for an open world, mixed in with some unnecessary open areas in between each city. Which just might have been one of the lowest points in the series. Like, we could have cut this and nothing would have been lost from this game. I don't know, it just became tedious to play after the first couple of assassinations. But anyways, those are really all of my thoughts on Assassin's Creed 1. No ranking yet though, since it's the only one so far. So I guess we'll just continue on for now. Two. So may see two facts for you. It was originally released November 17th, 2009 for the 360 and PS3, and once again developed by Ubisoft Montreal. And to give some context, I played the remasters of AC2, Brotherhood, and Revelations on the PS4, all a part of the HDO collection. And another little tidbit to give some more context, the AC team had tripled in size between the release of AC1 and AC2, which I think really shows here. And another fun fact for you that you might have forgotten because I sure the hell did, was that Lucy is played by Kristen Bell, which man, I can't, I can't believe this was the height of her career. It, it was, it was all totally downhill from here. Anyway, let's review AC2. Now this is a game that feels worthy of a title as cool as Assassin's Creed, and hey, it actually feels like a game. Almost all of my problems from the first entry are fixed in the follow-up. The major systems from the first game, like helping citizens to create more hiding places, take a back seat to actually let the game explore some more creative ways to explore and engage with the world and let the gameplay breathe a little more. The story this time around actually feels like it has a personality, not just with the characters, but the world AC2 built with Italy, and even greatly expanding on the war between the Assassins and Templars in the past and in the present. The story is majorly sold by the performances, which was stepped up tenfold compared to the first, and the fantastic writing that sells you very quickly on the charming Ezio Auditore. Your sister seemed quite satisfied with the handling I gave her earlier. <laughs> His journey is a classic hero vengeance tale with a great cast of supporting characters, whether they're historically accurate or not, that all builds up into some of the most get hype moments in the entire series. Seriously, when Ezio discovers almost all of the people he has met over the years were all assassins and are all ready to induct him into the Creed is a super cool moment to see in his perspective. Because honestly, before that, it was pretty obvious to all of us that they were assassins, right? Like, that, that was obvious. Also, not to mention that you're friends with people like Machiavelli and Da Vinci. The series early on did such a good job at incorporating really cool historical figures into the main story with Machiavelli being a mentor and Da Vinci being your best friend. They hit the cool heights so early on that I honestly think it was hard to follow up with after such a fun cast of characters. And one quick thing I want to shout out is that this game has the best story when it comes to the modern day and precursor stuff, and that's honestly because they melded the two stories together so well, and when everything comes together at the end with Ezio asking, What? Who is Desmond? Be honest, we all got chills. My only few complaints with the story is that we kill so many people in this one, it's hard to keep track of who was responsible for what and why they are all relevant to Ezio's story. It becomes worth it though because they're all excuses to meet Ezio's soon to be adopted family. Also, the big bad Rodrigo Borgia was a way cooler villain in my mind thinking back on my original playthrough than he ended up being. So if there was anything this one didn't follow up super well with after the first one, it was the villain. But I don't think that matters as much because of the slow reveal of Ezio's new adopted family, it's similar to the first Guardians of the Galaxy in a way. The villain is basic and only serves as some kind of force for the heroes to face, but the focus is really on the heroes and how they come together, which I think this game does a really solid job at doing. Anyways, besides the story, the gameplay and open world areas are solid and even for an 11 year old semi open world Ubisoft game, it holds up surprisingly well. The one thing that I really noticed this time around though, much like the first game, the open world doesn't feel super necessary outside 
outside of a few fun collectibles. Which is fine, remember this is a game that came out when developers were trying to figure out what actually makes a third person action open world game engaging, and AC2 was almost there. It's just interesting to go back to what most consider to be the Assassin's Creed game, and it still doesn't have quite as much as we remember it having when it comes to the classic Assassin's Creed open world formula. There's no territory to take back, no guard towers to eliminate, so the most you get out of the side activities are getting into brawls or races, which are fun when you want to break from Ezio's story, but not enough to keep you wanting to explore everything you have access to, with the exception of getting Altair's master outfit because Ezio looks cool as fuck in it and the mystery of the first civilization, which makes for some fun puzzles to think about. I guess what I'm saying is, is that because the open world doesn't feel quite as engaging as I once thought it was, the relationship between the story and the world doesn't flow as well as I would have liked it, but it was still good overall and it was nice to have a visually more interesting place to run around in. Now, to no surprise, my ranking as of now has to be Assassin's Creed 2 over Assassin's Creed, so yeah, number one, Assassin's Creed 2, number two, Assassin's Creed 1. It feels like an actual game, even for today's standards, and going back to this story after so long was such a fun trip. But Ezio's story is only just beginning. Let's move on to... Some Brotherhood facts for you, it was originally released on November 16th, 2010 for the 360 and PlayStation 3 and was developed, again, by Ubisoft Montreal. Now, it's interesting because I thought Assassin's Creed games started moving from studio to studio much earlier on in the franchise than it actually did, but there was a new director uh, that was brought on for this game since the series quickly moved to a yearly release, so we did kind of get some new hands into this game. Also, well-known fact, but still fun, the reason this was titled Brotherhood and not AC3 is because Ubisoft didn't want to give the impression that you would be playing as a new character, and they thought naming it Brotherhood wouldn't build that expectation. Which I always thought was a cool idea, save the numbered titles for when you're moving on and bringing in a new main character, and only like a subtitle when you're continuing a previous character's story. Real cool that they definitely um, continued on that route and didn't quickly give up on it or anything. Holy shit, this is the game, y'all. This is where I believe Ubisoft perfected the Assassin's Creed formula. All of the elements they played around with before, like upgrading buildings to get more money in your pocket, mixed with new elements for the series like separating Rome into districts that you have to take back by taking down Borgia Towers, keep you constantly engaged and connects enough to the story of taking Rome from the Templars, which gives you actual motivation to explore the world, upgrade as much as you can to be powerful enough to take back a district, and weaken the Templars' grip over the city. While this Ubisoft open world formula seems pretty basic now compared to a lot of their other games today, there's something great about the simplicity of it that makes it so fun. I also appreciate that the game is solely focused on one big area this time around, with the exception of one small segment in Spain, rather than a few smaller maps like AC1 and AC2 had. I know for the first two games it probably had to do with technical limitations, but for me it just helps overall with keeping the game a little more focused. Overall, Brotherhood has a more focused gameplay loop with its open world and systems, while also expanding on certain elements to keep you around and fully explore this open world outside of just the story. Again, just connecting the side activities to the actual story of destroying everything underneath Cesare makes it all the more satisfying. Also, real quick, can we just talk about how badass it is when you recruit assassins and when you have enough recruits at pretty much any time you can call them out of the blue to kill people for you? Why has that not been a staple since this game and Revelations? I mean, yeah, it made some things easier, but it was never guaranteed that your assassins would make it out every time, which is what was so cool about it. God, I just, I love the gameplay for Brotherhood, an open world that is 10 years old that is still super fun to play, that's, that's impressive. So while Brotherhood expands on gameplay to make Assassin's Creed more refined, at the same time, the story is scaled back to not overcomplicate things. It's just a simple revenge story with one clear villain who has developed enough for you to actually hate him and want to take him down, not just because the game tells you to. Ezio continues to be a fun character to play as, now with a villain almost as memorable as him, slowly taking Everything in Rome away from Cesare Borza is perfect vengeance after everything was taken from Ezio with the attack on his villa, especially Mario. Mamma mia! 
and slowly seeing how crazy Cesare is and witnessing what he'll do to stay in power makes the final blow all the more satisfying. The only downfalls of the story are that the buildup to inducting Ezio's sister, Claudia, into the Creed should have been better fleshed out. It just sort of happens and it would have been cool for it to be this grand moment of seeing another Auditori getting their moment and her moment also gets overshadowed by Ezio becoming the head of the assassins. Really cool and satisfying in its own right but still begs the question of what even was the point of bringing in Claudia. Also, there feels like there's no closure to Ezio's Brotherhood chapter. It's cut short to get to the 2012 plotline. And while Brotherhood's current day story is some of the best in the series, I still would have liked to see Ezio say goodbye to the great cast of characters in this game, especially knowing we really won't see any of them in his final chapter. I don't know, I just wanted there to be more closure, I guess. It's just interesting looking back and realizing that Ubisoft didn't really know how to end the ancestor stories to make them emotionally satisfying in their own right in these early games. It makes me wonder if that was a main reason why Ubisoft started drifting away from the modern day stuff because it might have been difficult for them to balance telling two stories. It's just weird that the main story for most of these early games are just used at the end of the day as plot devices for what is essentially kind of the side story. Like yeah, the modern day stuff is cool and especially the way this one ends with killing Lucy and not fully knowing what's happening to Desmond. Like what a cliffhanger, but there's no satisfying closure at the end of it for Ezio besides killing Cesare. I know this is much more of a personal thing, but I couldn't help but think that both of Ezio's stories so far end at the climax with no falling action or resolution. It's just kind of jarring to me. While many credit AC2 as the defining moment in the series, I truly think Brotherhood is the game that set the precedent for all of the games after it. AC2 was the game that made Assassin's Creed an actual game, but Brotherhood refined that and introduced so much that was important for the series. If we didn't have it, Assassin's Creed could have looked very, very different. To me, this is the most important game in the series and to this day, truly one of the best. And because of that, of the games I've talked about so far, it deserves to be at the top, no doubt. So the list as of right now is number one, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, number two, Assassin's Creed 2, and number three, Assassin's Creed 1. While I recognize that AC2 might be more iconic because of the major jump between 1 and 2, Assassin's Creed really found its footing in this game. But for now, let's move on to the final chapter of one of the best protagonists in Assassin's Creed. Now some facts for you about Assassin's Creed Revelations, it was originally released on November 15th, 2011 on the 360 and PlayStation 3, continuing the cycle of a yearly release and was developed by Ubisoft Montreal once again. Another fun fact for you, and this one is absolutely fascinating for me because I've never heard of it before, Assassin's Creed Revelations was originally intended to be a Nintendo 3DS game called Lost Legacy, which would have featured Ezio going to Mashiav, the city the Assassins operated out of during Altair's time. It was announced at the 2010 Nintendo E3 press conference and then was quietly canceled with this game coming out of that idea. Two things to bring up here. One, it would have been fascinating to see something like this on 3DS, I imagine it would have been like a Bloodlines type of deal. And two, it really shows how fast Ubisoft was turning these games around. To cancel a project you have to imagine sometime in 2010, and then turning that idea around to be conceptually probably a much bigger game the following year is insane. I like I honestly can't imagine what those work hours must have looked like. You know the saying, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Well, I'm not even mad or disappointed with this game. It just kind of exists for me. Not to say I don't enjoy things about this game, which we'll get to in a minute, but there's just something about this game that just doesn't stand out to me overall compared to all of the others. It slightly expands on some game play elements here and there, but none of them were really hitting the improvements I thought Brotherhood made. It kind of loses its own voice because it does a lot to be Brotherhood again, but with decisions here and there that didn't make it as enjoyable as its predecessor. So to really get into it, I do think the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is as good as Brotherhood. The parkouring feels really good, especially with the addition of the hook blade, which added a bit to how fast you could really traverse up a building without losing the feeling of being engaged and being able to zip line to or over enemies to make for some fun and quick attacks is a delight. One of the additions for gameplay that stood out to me was one of the main missions that turns the game into a tower defense game. It was an interesting effort to mix up the gameplay, but that's not what I personally look for when it comes to Assassin's Creed, but thankfully it was contained in only one main mission. I think there might have been side quests where you do the tower defense thing more. I might be wrong, but that's just how disinterested I 
wasn't it that I didn't even see how much of it was even optional in the game. And one quick note before I get into my big gripe over some systems is I know I haven't talked about combat a lot, and that's because none of it has really stood out to me. There are tiny adjustments here and there, but so far and for the next few games, it's all pretty much the same. Attack, parry, then auto kill as many fools as you want. I don't think it's been bad at all so far, but right now it feels like a if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of situation. And that's why I haven't really felt the need to really get into the combat. It's old AC combat. If you know, you know. Not to say I dislike it, I just don't find it very interesting to talk about. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about gameplay wise is the wanted system, interestingly enough. We know it well, you'll have a wanted meter that goes up depending on how much killing or other illegal stuff you do in front of guards. This was really focused on an AC2 and was such a cool system that made an open world feel different than a GTA open world wanted system. You can kill officials, pay off heralds, and take down wanted posters. Each action would take away a certain percentage of your wanted level. I won't go through specifics for every one, but wanted posters took away about 25% of your wanted level. So they were the only task available if your wanted level wasn't super high because the other activities wouldn't show up unless you had a certain wanted level. So why am I just bringing this up in Revelations? Because they took away the wanted posters. All you could do was bribe or kill, but if your wanted level was still around but super low, you could never fully get rid of it. Which I know at the end of the day wasn't super important, and you could think about it as the enemies at least always being slightly aware of your presence presence, but man, it really bothered me. The annoyance went away for a bit, but when I started AC3 right afterwards, they brought wanted posters back, but it brought the frustration back again and made me yell, see, why was that so hard to do in Revelations? I don't know, it's a dumb point, but it is a certified Barrett Courtney point if I do say so myself. Now, honestly, when it comes to the story side of this game, I don't know if I have too much to say about it. While the modern day stuff felt like a disappointing follow up to the cliffhanger that Brotherhood left us on, I did still think it was a cool idea that because Desmond spent so much time in the Animus, it couldn't distinguish between him, Ezio, and Altair. So that's why he has to relive certain Ezio memories so the Animus can understand who is who. And we finally get some sort of payoff for Subject 16, who's a complete dick the entire time, but kind of sacrifices himself at the end, so he's kind of cool. I don't want to be here anymore. And as far as the historical portion of the story, I think it's solid, but nothing necessarily to write home about. Even though I wanted Ezio's final chapter to be more personal for his journey and have better closure with Italy and the other characters from there that we grew to love, I do think this is a solid goodbye for him and some of the new cast did distract me from my longing for the old cast. Sofia Sartor was a good love interest that finally gave Ezio a reason to leave this life of being an assassin and was a strong enough character on her own that I I understood why Ezio would want to leave it all behind for her. I really liked Yusuf and was sad when he was killed and I thought Suleiman was a solid replacement for Da Vinci as the historical figure that's your good friend and his story with his uncle as the villain I thought was really well done and not overcomplicated. A simple power struggle between the two with some family politics, I didn't hate it. And before I forget, I also like what they did with Altair's story and how you learn about his adventure after the events of AC1. He has more personality and loses everything despite attempting to try and hold his creed together, and you really feel for him and want him to come out on top when he returns to Mashiav to fix everything. It's unfortunate that he didn't have anything this compelling in his own game, and honestly, this one made me want more out of his story, but like Ezio, I still think it was a solid way to end Altair's story and for Ubisoft to move on and not be pigeon-held to these characters any longer than they already were. Although, Ezio's final message to Desmond was pretty freaking cool. Desmond? He's talking to me? I heard your name once before, Desmond. A long time ago. And now it lingers in my mind like an image from an old dream. So I think overall, while I do think this is the weakest in the Ezio trilogy, I still think it's a good game in its own right. Nothing stood out to me as crazy amazing, but nothing stood out to me as crazy horrible. So it's... It's good, it's fine. So I think the obvious choice for where to rank this one right now is below AC2 and right above AC1. So right now the list is as follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number two, Assassin's Creed 2. Number three, Assassin's Creed Revelations. And number four, Assassin's Creed 1. And there you have it. We've hit the end of an era in the Assassin's Creed franchise, but there's still so much to go. So let's introduce ourselves to an entirely new cast of characters, at least for the historical portion of these games, and talk about... Thank you. 
Now some facts for you for AC3, it was originally released on October 30th, 2012, which will actually be semi-relevant to a talking point I have later on. For the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, and to give context, I played the remaster on PS4, and was developed again by Ubisoft Montreal. And another fun fact for you, the development for this game began in early 2010 in between the release of AC2 and AC Brotherhood and was in development for two and a half years, which made it at the time the game with the longest development cycle in the series since the first game. It's so interesting to have a, a yearly series where you're turning around games so quickly, uh, but still being able to work on some games here and there for, for several years and put them in the yearly release schedule. I, I don't know, it's a fascinating and absolutely terrifying system that they had for the AC franchise early on. Now, AC3 is an interesting one because while it stood out at the time for finally having a new protagonist with a more modern setting compared to Italy during the Renaissance, before replaying it, all I would have been able to tell you about it is that you play as Connor Kenway, a half-white, half-Native American man who is new to the Assassins, and his father, Haytham Kenway, was the bad guy. I remember at the time of release, while I found it enjoyable, the new setting added a lot of new ways to traverse and parkour, which made for a good amount of headaches. It went back to the way of the first two games with several smaller maps, which I've always thought made the games feel disjointed in a weird way. There was the four ship combat stuff that's better implemented in Black Flag, but feels weird here. This game is just kind of all over the place gameplay wise. And playing it for the first time in eight years, it still feels that way a lot, but I really appreciated the story side of it more. I thought it was a well-told story. The Hatham Kenway reveal of being a Templar was cool. And while it does take a little too long to get there, I appreciate that they have you spend just enough time with him to make you think, oh, he must be one of the good guys and he's building up a new assassin group in the colonies. And then they flip you on your head once they reveal him, Charles Lee, and others all being Templars. It's a fun build up to get to know all of the antagonists that you'll eventually take down. I just didn't need a whole chapter of a mutiny on a boat that did absolutely nothing for the story. There were so many things like that throughout the game that could have just been cut and would have made for a better story and game overall. But even with my frustrations here and there, I do think the story structure in this game is the strongest in the series so far with the games I've talked about. The first act introduces the bad guys in a clever way, then introduces you to the protagonist, Connor, living his normal life that is quickly taken away from him. Then the second act is him learning about the assassins, training over the years to earn his place in the Creed, which at this point in the timeline and lore had been completely destroyed in the colonies, except for your teacher, Achilles. And the third act is Connor finally taking down the Templars, who were the cause of the attack on his village and the death of his mother. It finally felt like clear storytelling that wasn't just used as a plot device for the modern day 2012 end of the world story. While I unfortunately think Connor was overshadowed by Ezio because he doesn't quite have Ezio's charm, I do really like Connor as a protagonist because while well, he helped the revolution and helped the colonies, at the end of the day, he wasn't interested in the fight between white people. All he cared about was making sure his people were safe, which was the only reason he wanted to be an assassin, to have the tools and experience to do just that, and making sure the people who attacked his village paid for it. And the end really hits hard because while his journey ended after he took down all of the major Templars, the land for his village got sold to the US, he sees slave trading happening after the British leave. Like he did all of this stuff to try to secure a better future, but it all ended up feeling like it was for nothing, which is the real tragedy of it all, and you really feel that. The last two things I want to talk about for the story is, number one, I thought it was cool that Connor and Haytham teamed up for a bit to go after some rogue Templar. It built their strained relationship in such a cool, intense way that makes their final fight even sadder. It makes you think about what could have been if Haytham wasn't a piece of shit. I don't know, it just really stood out to me this time. I really liked it. And two, the modern day stuff. If you don't know, this was really the last Assassin's Creed game that really focused on the modern day stuff because of course, it was the last game to star Desmond since he sacrificed his life at the end for the sake of humanity. And I think the thing that is really disappointing about this game is none of it felt satisfying. They build up all of the precursor stuff so well in Two and Brotherhood and this looming threat of the end of the world in 2012 made it all feel so intense, but when we finally get to that event, it feels anticlimactic. You're either in a cave just hanging out or going on missions, which were cool, we finally started seeing all of the assassin stuff we've seen so far in a modern setting, but because no one outside of Desmond or Lucy, who was killed off two games ago, was built up well as characters, none of it feels interesting. So the questions I'm gonna throw out here are pure hypotheticals. Did Ubisoft feel the need to force all the 2012 stuff into this game because this game released in the year 
2012? Or did they just naturally feel like they needed to wrap up Desmond's story because they knew they couldn't balance two major storylines at the same time? Honestly, I, I don't know. It was a really weird choice for where we were at in the story naturally, and it really makes the ending of the Desmond era feel like a, a, like a wet fart. But at the same time, I do agree that they really needed to get away from it so the assassin stories from the past could get the attention that they deserved and needed in the writer's room. Anyway, last thing before I move on, shout out to Desmond's dad, who was Jane's dad in Breaking Bad and Q in Star Trek. Just another funny casting I thought was cool and immediately recognized when I heard his voice in Revelations. Oh, and also Connor's mom, who plays Tannis in Letterkenny. She was another one that I immediately recognized. Seriously, watch Letterkenny. It's on Hulu in the US. Watch it. It's hilarious. Let the burning of Letterkenny begin. Anyways, aside from the story stuff, like I said earlier, this game is all over the place gameplay-wise. It's experimenting with a lot, which I understand it kind of needed to do to keep the franchise interesting, and separate this one from the previous games even more because of the new setting and protagonist. This game just felt like, let's throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. It's the Iron Man 2 of video games. It does just well enough to serve itself, but does have a lot of forced things that are used to build up sequels. The regular sneaking around, assassinating, and fighting people gameplay isn't changed super much, but the additions to what you can parkour on, the out-of-place ship missions, and more all felt like they needed another round of polish. Also, quick shout out to the music in the remaster glitching out on me all the time. Whenever I would go to sync at an eagle point uh, to reveal a part of the map, the music for that action would start. It's like a specific track, and it would never ever go away. It would continue in cutscenes and other activities. It would only go away once I shut off the game and reloaded my save. So that was really fun and not annoying. Despite my complaints, I do think this is a solid, albeit sometimes frustrating, entry for the Assassin's Creed franchise. It has a better story than I remember it having, and honestly, it might be my favorite story of the games I've talked about so far, and only because revisiting these earlier entries, they haven't been as exciting upon revisiting them. While the game was a little more buggy and took a backward step in my mind in open world structure, it still stands out more to me than some of the early AC games, which, to be fair, well, to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, to be fair. To be fair. To be fair, pretty much all have their fair share of issues. I think people just noticed it more here since it was a new environment and protagonist for the franchise, so it was put more under a microscope than the other games. So because of that, I am ranking Assassin's Creed 3 below Assassin's Creed 2 and above Assassin's Creed Revelations. So the current list is number 1 Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, number 2 AC2, number 3 AC3, number 4 AC Revelations, and number 5 AC1. Is it above Revelations solely for the fact that wanted posters are back? Who's to say? In all seriousness though, I think both AC3 and Revelations are both solid. I just, personally for me, I think AC3 stands out a little more. Unfortunately, Connor's story came and went very quickly, but AC3 is not the last we see of the Kenway family. So now, let's talk about... I'm just so excited, y'all. It's motherfucking pirate time. Now some facts for you, Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was originally released on October 29th, 2013 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. It was released less than a month later as a launch game for the next-gen consoles at the time, the PS4 and Xbox One. And even though this was the last Assassin's Creed game that released before the launch of the PS4 and Xbox One, this was somehow not the last Assassin's Creed game developed for the 360 and PS3. And to give context, I played the Switch port of this game this time around, and I don't want to factor that in too much here. I know, like, I've, I just want to give context what I'm playing each game on system-wise. So far for, like, PC and PS4 performance-wise, they've, they've been fine. Like, they kind of run like they used to with some new glitches here and there. So my notes on the port, because I do kind of want to bring it up for Black Flag because this was the only game I decided to play on Switch, is that it was crazy how well it ran on handheld and kind of not too surprising how much it chugs when docked, similar to Breath of the Wild when Breath of the Wild came out. So if you want to have this on the go, like I don't think the Switch is a bad place to play it and it's, it's really fun and works really well in handheld mode. But anyway, moving on, it was developed mainly by Ubisoft Montreal with help from Ubisoft Milan and Ubisoft Kiev, making this the first title in the franchise to have multiple studios and multiple creative directors. And fun fact, this is the first and only title in the series to have both a number and a subtitle, a decision that was apparently made to distinguish itself from the rest of the series with its pirate theme, which to me says, 
We're tired of doing the numbered titles, we just want to do subtitles, but this is our way to ease out of it. Honestly, I, I miss the numbered titles. It felt like an event. Like, hey, this is like a new era for Assassin's Creed. I get why they moved past it. Like, we haven't had a main protagonist uh, span across several games since Ezio. But I just kind of miss the days where, like, a, a couple of AC games with subtitles rather than uh, numbers would come out. And you're like, oh, yeah, these are cool. And then AC3 would come out, and you're like, damn, this is like an event. But honestly, if they followed that convention, we'd be at Assassin's Creed 10. So yeah, I get it. But it also begs the question of why no one has gotten multiple games since Ezio. Where are the Edwork, Bayek, and Shea sequels, y'all? Anyways, where to start with this one? I guess I should start by saying that I love Pirates. So if my blatant bias of that shows here, I'm not sorry. Pirate stories are rad as hell. The first three Pirates of the Caribbean movies are the most underrated trilogy of all time. And Treasure Planet did not get the love it deserved. And while going back to this game all the way through for the first time since release, I don't think the story as a whole is fantastic. There's still a lot in here thematically that I really dig. So this one has us playing as Edward Kenway, who is the grandfather of Connor, the protagonist of AC3, and the father of Haytham, one of the antagonists of AC3. When we focus on just his journey throughout the game, I do really love it. We get flashbacks of him in a struggling relationship with his wife when he wants to go be a privateer to make money, but when she leaves him, he really has nothing to fight for. So naturally he becomes a pirate and a damn famous one at that. He joins pirates like Blackbeard and more to try and fight for a pirate utopia. At the same time, he fell ass backwards in this war between the Assassins and Templars. They try to find this place called the Observatory. And Edward's only interest in their war for most of the game is to find the Observatory himself for riches, which is the most pirate ass thing to do. But after his fellow pirate captains like Blackbeard and Reed, who was an assassin the entire time, die because of Templars exploiting the pirates and actually get getting some captains to side with their cause, Edward realizes he does have something to fight for and joins the assassins in the end to prevent the Templars from gaining access to the observatory rather than just using it for his own gain. I guess I just really love a pirate with a heart of gold who realizes that their way of life is not something that's truly sustainable. Edward has so much growth in this game, starting as a cocky and quippy pirate who only stands for himself and ending as someone fighting for a just and righteous cause, and Jesus, the final cutscene where Edward decides to care for his daughter since his wife had died back in England and to go back home to establish a creed in London but before he gets on the jackdaw he looks around at where him and Mary considered starting their pirate utopia and sees all of his dead friends hanging out and it's just so sad because it makes you think about the life they could have lived without this crazy secret society war going on and man it it just hurt and all the harm that ever I've done Alas, it was to none but me And all I've done For want of a wit To memory now I can Also, shout out to the scene where Blackbeard dies. I did not remember it being that emotional to see him go. He was about to leave his life as a pirate, and it was such a pointless act for the Templars to make. It just hit different. So when we look at the story through that specific lens, it is one of my favorites. However, the story does get super messy with the amount of enemies in this one. Like, there's no clear villain until Bartholomew Roberts, who was a real pirate from history, at the very end starts helping you out, but then betrays you because he's a sage, which is someone who carries the blood of the pre cursor race and I think can also live for a long time or live several lives. Still unsure about that because the way they explain it is too complicated. I don't know, the villain side of the story was just a jumbled mess and unfortunately it was such a big part of the story that it was too hard to ignore. But I did kind of like how they tied the past story to connect with the present day one where you're an employee at Abstergo and the tech guy turns out to be a reincarnation of the sage. Which again, I think would have hit more if the sage was presented as the villain throughout the entire game. I don't feel the need to focus too much on the current day story now just because Desmond's dead and for the next few games you play as a faceless avatar. It just doesn't really matter to me for now. They're just vessels to be able to tell cool stories from the past, which to me is actually better than what the games used to be. Cool stories from the past being used as plot devices to further the current day story that kind of went nowhere. So moving on, while I can't say much about the sword combat, stealth mechanics, and parkouring that we've already seen in all of the other games, except for some new stealth weapons, I will say I think all of those things feel the best here. It feels 
feels like because of the ship combat that was added and focused on as a major part of this game, Ubisoft didn't really feel the need to change the formula with everything else. And since none of the stuff that we know as Assassin's Creed staples were really changed, they could instead focus on just polishing those features up to not feel glitchy or unresponsive or bugged. The entire game just feels so smooth. Were there still annoying moments where Edward jumped and climbed somewhere I didn't want him to? Yes, but those moments felt so fewer and farther between, which is really impressive when you consider that this was the biggest AC game at the time. And if you really wanted to do everything or even just most things, it was by far the longest at the time. But really, just hats off to the ship combat in this game. I, I know the term, it makes you feel, has been overused, but it really makes you feel like a badass pirate when you just cause chaos and go after any ship to take their supplies, upgrade the jackdaw, upgrade your tiny utopia, it's all just so damn cool. And I really dig that they keep the premise of the Borza Tower system here. But instead of taking on enemy camps by yourself to take control of pieces of the map, you take down naval forts and the jackdaw, and it just makes for some fun and ridiculous fights. It was a cool way to adapt that system to make sense for the life of a pirate. So before I wrap up on this game, because I know I've taken a lot of time gushing and criticizing already, I want to shout out one of the top three features of any Assassin's Creed game. Shanties. Mother fucking shanties. There's just a nice warmth and peace that I find when I'm just casually sailing around and my crew just starts singing. It's the feature that sells you on just cruising around in your ship instead of fast traveling. This feeling of just feeling satisfied by sailing around hasn't felt this good since Wind Waker. Anyways, after everything I've said, I think the only place I can really put this on the ranking as of right now is number one, above Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. So the ranking currently is as follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Number two, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number three, Assassin's Creed 2. Number four, Assassin's Creed 3. Number five, Assassin's Creed Revelations. And number six, Assassin's Creed 1. I know there's some things here and there in the story that aren't as strong as Brotherhood, but I love Edward's story and growth so much. And the amount of gameplay opportunities you have available to you as a pirate are just fantastic. I will say though, even with my major bias towards pirate stories, this time around, Black Flag is only slightly higher than Brotherhood for me. Before this, I would have said Black Flag is way farther ahead than all of these other games I've talked about so far, but going back to it seven years later, I did see where the game faltered at times, so the margin between Brotherhood and Black Flag is definitely smaller. Sadly, that's all we really got out of Edward being the main protagonist in an AC game. But it's time to move on from our charming idiot pirate himbo and wrap up what is known as the American Trilogy in Assassin's Creed with... Some AC Rogue facts for you, it was originally released on November 11th, 2014 for the 360 and PS3 and was the last game developed for that generation of consoles and launched the same day as Assassin's Creed Unity. 2014 was the only year two mainline AC games launched and honestly, I think it's this that led to the major Assassin's Creed fatigue among fans that everybody talks about. Two games on the same day, one last gen, one current gen, it's just, that was a lot of Assassin's Creed to pay attention to all at once. And again, to give some quick context, I played the PS4 remastered version of the game. Rogue was developed by Ubisoft Sophia, and it's the first game in the series where Montreal was not the lead developer. Again, I thought, and I don't know why I thought this, maybe just because I knew Call of Duty was rotating developers and stuff, and this being another yearly release, I was thinking that they switch studios every year, but man, it's crazy to think that the first Assassin's Creed game to not be developed by Montreal was the last one to come out on the original gen uh, consoles that the franchise started on. Now, I don't have any development fun facts, but I have a personal fun fact uh, since this release on the same day as Unity. Originally, I didn't play this game until after I played Unity. I played Unity first just because it was next gen, it was made for next gen. I was more excited about it. There was a new setting. It seemed to be like new systems and stuff like that. So I was just, I wanted to pick that one up first. So I decided to play Rogue first this time around to see what the transition was like with the gameplay style, the story, and all of that. And I'm really interested in and want to hear from anyone who naturally played Rogue first, because I can only imagine that the ending did not pay off whatsoever. Maybe I'm wrong, who knows? Seriously, 
if you played Rogue first, leave your thoughts in the comments on like what that ending did for you. So Rogue continues down the path that Black Flag laid out with focusing on ship combat and has you revisit a lot of the same locations from AC3. So when it comes to the gameplay, nothing too much has changed from Black Flag for Rogue to stand out. There are minor things here and there, like the grenade launcher, which was fine. But yeah, none of those additions were really revolutionary. Some of the new things that I enjoyed, though, since you play it as an assassin turned Templar, enemy towers and camps are twisted for that and always come with an equipped assassin to take out alongside the normal enemies you encounter throughout the game. And it makes for some really tense hide and seek. And I really enjoyed that. It was just a minor spin on an activity we've seen in the series since Brotherhood that made it feel semi-fresh this time around. And I like that a lot of those were mixed in with the enemy forts we saw in Black Flag. It made taking areas away from enemy control feel varied to a certain extent, so it didn't feel as repetitive as the other games when it comes to clearing the map of enemy towers slash forts. And really, the only other thing gameplay-wise I want to bring up, and I know I bring it up every time now because I'm a stickler when it comes to this, but to me, Rogue did go overboard, pun intended, with the pure size of the game. I understand with Rogue and a lot of the games that have multiple maps are done this way to be able to access important places in history for the time period so you can be at specific events, but again, to me, it feels like unnecessary fat. And Rogue, I think, does it the worst. There's just too much and it feels daunting because of that, but then a lot of it feels empty once you really get into exploring. It honestly made me wonder why a game with such a short story needed this big of a map. But speaking of story, honestly, honestly, possibly the best story in the series so far. Far. To get it out of the way, modern day stuff is very forgettable. You're a faceless avatar working at Abstergo again, and the end they reveal to you that they're Templars, which is something that you, the player, has known since AC1. And they ask you to officially join them as a Templar and not just as an Abstergo employee, which is kind of interesting because it makes you think about how Abstergo works as a company that is secretly ran by Templars, but besides that, whatever. Join us, and a bright future will be all yours. But the main story with Shay Cormack, who's part of the American Creed years after the events of Black Flag, is just so freaking cool. He leaves the order after going to a precursor site, which caused the 1755 Lisbon earthquake, which, if you don't know, killed 30,000 people. Shay sees firsthand what these types of temples can do and implores the Creed to not try and find these sites anymore, but they don't listen to him. So he decides to leave because his faith with this order he had been slowly rising through the ranks in is shaken. But before we even get there, I really like that we spend a couple of hours with Shay in the order to really understand his relationship with all of the people who would eventually become his enemies. The quote unquote villains in this game are, I think, one of the strongest in the series because they're so well established at the very beginning. And you really understand why Shay feels the need to leave. He's carrying the weight of all of those deaths, and when the Creed kind of shrugs it off, you feel the shitty position they put him in. All those souls lost. One more hardly matters. So of course he joins up with the Templars slightly through happenstance. And I like that through a lot of the journey, he's not even officially a Templar, but is just helping them out to help prevent the assassins from getting to more of these precursor temples. And it is a big, oh fuck moment when Haytham Kenway comes out to formally induct him into the order. This game does such a good job at playing off of characters that were introduced in the last two games. You really appreciate the importance of Haytham, Adewale, who was Edward Kenway's first mate who joined the assassins, and a Achilles. And man, taking down the order throughout this game and realizing Shay is the reason Achilles was the only one left in the Americas during AC3 just fucking hits you. Like, you are the bad guy in this game in a sense, but you understand why you're the bad guy. But it doesn't make it any less painful when you kill Adewale and even some of the smaller characters that were introduced in this game, because both sides feel so betrayed and you just wish they could work it out. And it was even harder when it comes to fighting Liam, who seemed to be like a brother to Shay in the Creed and was quickly rising through the ranks. Again, this game really sells you on the turmoil that Shay has to go through, and that's why it's one of the most interesting stories in AC still to this day. My one slight gripe with the story was how they wrote themselves into a corner with Achilles, who is at the mercy of Haytham and Shay at the very end, and because Achilles is alive in AC3, which takes place after this game, they make Shay stop Haytham from killing him because Achilles is defeated, and it feels like a very weak excuse with what they've gone through, and it's absolutely not how Templars operate. 
operate. I know you can make the argument that Shea wasn't always a Templar, so that's why he has the instinct to not kill unnecessarily, but I think it would have made more sense in a more powerful moment to have Shea let Haytham kill Achilles. For continuity sense, I get it, but for the sake of the story being told just in this game, I thought it was kind of weak. But besides that, I really liked everything else, even the way the ending of Shea's story ties into AC Unity, where he kills someone important in the Creed in Paris. That was a cool way to connect two separate protagonist stories together, but while I dig it on this end, I think the way Unity handles it on that end is a little disappointing, but we'll get to that. At the end of the day, Rogue is a really nice hidden gem. I didn't remember it super much before replaying it other than Shay turning into a Templar, but after playing these games back to back, I really think the story is top notch. Although I still think the gameplay feels a little bland overall, and it seems like Ubisoft started to feel that way too because things start to change a lot after this game. With all of that countering in here, I, I think I gotta put Rogue right above AC3 and right below AC2. So the current ranking is as follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Number two, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number three, Assassin's Creed 2. Number four, Assassin's Creed Rogue. Number five, Assassin's Creed 3. Number six, Assassin's Creed Revelations. And number seven, Assassin's Creed 1. I think the main decision here is that even though I think AC3 and Rogue have the strongest stories, I think Rogue's story is a little stronger, but only slightly. While the gameplay in Rogue feels tired, it's still almost as solid as Black Flag and puts you in a good amount of interesting gameplay situations, where the gameplay in AC3 has way more lows than Rogue. It's truly the end of an era here with us talking about the last AC game made for the 360 and PS3, the consoles that were essentially the birthplace of the series, and with us moving on to what were the next gen games at the time, it's time to talk about the attempted rebirth and rebuilding of the franchise. Let's talk about... Some facts about the first game that was truly made for the PS4 and Xbox One. AC Unity originally released on November 11th, 2014 for the PS4 and Xbox One and was developed by Ubisoft Montreal. Now, I don't really have a fun development fact for you, but I do have another personal fun fact. This game originally came out before I was in the games industry, before I even knew I wanted to do games industry stuff, but I remember being excited for it and I think I remember learning about this from an IGN post that the review embargo wasn't allowed to go, like wasn't up until after the game officially launched. Like the game launched at midnight and the review embargo wasn't up until like, I want to say like seven or eight Pacific that morning. It, it, it was weird. And even being like fresh and new to how the video game industry worked at the time, like being on the outside looking in and knowing how review embargoes worked in other industries, I knew the fact that the review embargo not going up until after the game was in the hands of consumers was a really bad sign. But I still drove to GameStop that morning and picked it up myself because I've always been a fan at heart. I wanted to, I wanted to experience it for myself. And at the time, I remember really enjoying it. I didn't experience a lot of the unusual bugs that people were reporting. And I say unusual because every Assassin's Creed has its fair share. So you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. I mean, before replaying it, I would not have been able to tell you anything Thing that happened in the game, but I do remember having fun with it. As for now, it's so interesting to go back to this game with all that we have today and to truly see it and appreciate it for what it is in the series. And I'll be very clear here in how I view this game now. This is the Assassin's Creed 1 for the PS4 and Xbox One generation. Like I said for Rogue, the franchise was starting to feel a little stale gameplay wise, and I'm sure Ubisoft started to see that too, so why not try to change things up with the first game on new hardware? It wasn't a massive shakeup like we'll see with the later games, but there's just enough here to to realize that Ubisoft was trying to bring in a new era for Assassin's Creed. Maybe I should have thought this through. There are separate buttons dedicated to parkouring up and down buildings, which makes it feel more engaging than in anything we've seen in the series so far. Combat, while not really changing in how it controls, is slightly changed so fighting guards isn't as easy as parrying and auto-killing everyone around you. So you actually have to think about how to fight or escape encounters with several enemies. RPG mechanics really show up in this one with how detailed your customized loadout can be, the addition of the ability tree, which helps you level up, needing to be the right level to properly take on missions 
missions and do activities across certain areas in Paris. Assassination missions feel like big moments where different optional events come along your path that you can take advantage of. But with all of these new additions that sound really cool, none of it feels quite right. And that's why this is the Assassin's Creed 1 of the PS4 and Xbox One. It has a lot of ideas that were put together, but end up feeling like almost a test demo in a weird way. While I really love the attempt to make the parkouring more engaging, it is buggy as hell. I talked about it in AC3 when so much was added to what you could parkour on. It created more scenarios where the game doesn't quite know where you actually want to go. And it's the same situation here, but the city of Paris isn't necessarily anything new to what we've seen before. So I think it stands out more of how bad the parkouring can sometimes feel. And not to mention overall movement while parkouring just doesn't feel super responsive in this game. It felt like I was trekking through an endless sea of mud for some reason. I know that's a really weird way to describe it, but that's the only way I can explain how it felt to me. But overall, movement was going towards the right direction, but stood out the most for how unresponsive it could be. Maybe it was the amount of NPCs in the game, maybe Yubi was trying to figure out the little things with parkouring up and down, and how that updated mechanics connected to the world. In Unity, it felt like one step forward, but almost two steps back. Besides that, while I do enjoy that we start to see Ubisoft treading in the RPG water with leveling and shoving customization right in your face, it didn't feel like it truly fit with how the world was designed, other than the enemies being certain levels. There was no flowing loop to me that made it all connect in a satisfying way. But the real highlight of what this game added were the assassination missions that were presented and felt like big moments. And honestly, that's what the first Assassin's Creed did so well. You do some reconnaissance that leads up to the big kill, and it feels like an important moment, and I think Unity has that as well. And I like that Unity adds little optional things you can do to get a unique kill or to be as sneaky as possible, to make you truly feel like you can take on this mission however you want. Unity does doesn't get enough credit for that. But the last thing really quick about the gameplay that I want to bring up is that while I appreciate that you mainly stay in Paris the entire time, which thank you, I like that we just stick to one focused area, something Unity stepped away from was enemy towers, which gave you the motivation to really explore the open world other than looking for chests. And that's why I think the RPG leveling system doesn't quite hit in this one for me, because there's nothing to build towards in your level besides the next story mission. I don't know, I just thought it was an interesting thing to take away after being a staple in the the series since Brotherhood. Again, there was a lot of experimenting going on in this one, so I get why they would want to step away from that system and see how it went. All right, I know I spent a lot of time on gameplay, and honestly, that's okay because I, I don't have much to say about the story other than I actually kind of enjoyed it. Arno is just as charming as Ezio or Edward. Unfortunately, I don't think he stands out just because his actual story doesn't come together in a way that's memorable. I dig the Romeo Juliet thing he has with uh, Elise de la Serre, with him becoming an assassin and her being a temp. It was a really cool concept to see them struggle between their feelings towards each other and with the order they have sworn themselves to. Everything around them, though, just wasn't as interesting. Another Assassin's Creed, another game that doesn't know how to build up an interesting villain. The villain is another sage, like the villain from Black Flag, and the slow build-up to get to him didn't make the reveal worth it. It's just another face that blends into the crowd of faces you kill in this game. Although I do like when your mentor turns on you, when you try to build an alliance between the Assassins and Elise, a known town. Templar member. It's a super emotional moment when you have to fight him, but that should have been the final villain in Encounter. He should have been the one to have killed Elise's father, which is why you joined the assassins in the first place. To me, that would have been a much more interesting buildup between all of these relationships than whoever the hell this dude was. I can't even tell you his name, and I don't care just enough to not even look it up right now. Bravo. You've slain the villain. That is how you cast this little morality play in your mind, isn't it? Another main gripe I have with this game, which was teased while I talked about Rogue, is that Arno never gets closure about the death of his father who was killed by Shay Cormac, the protagonist in Rogue. He didn't have to be the main villain, but it would have been cool to tie Shay in at some point for Arno to get his vengeance or some sort of closure. Playing these two games in this order really made me think about it this time around. This aspect of the story is only satisfying if you play Unity first, then Rogue, which feels like such an ass backwards way to do it, but that's just me. Oh, and. While the modern day stuff is really tossed to the side on this one, but Ubisoft just can't seem to let it go, I did like that even though you're still a faceless avatar, this time you're a consumer of Absurgo's entertainment products, and the assassins hijack your session to open your third eye to this modern day secret war that's going on. It was kind of a cool premise, but still kind of pointless at this point in the series. 
And my last thing, it's kind of telling that at the end of this game, the reason you went through Arno's story is kind of pointless because the skeleton everyone is looking for to open another precursor site or whatever was lost and therefore there was no need to go looking for it. That feeling kind of paints the picture of what Unity as whole is to me. Slightly interesting, but a complete waste of time. Anyways, this game is just kind of all over the place. So many cool ideas, but there's just no glue to tie it all together in a way that makes you want to keep playing and nothing to really make it stand out on its own. So that's why when all is said and done, I gotta put Assassin's Creed Unity above Assassin's Creed 1 and below Assassin's Creed Revelations. So the current ranking is as follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Number two, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number three, Assassin's Creed 2. Number four, Assassin's Creed Rogue. Number five, Assassin's Creed 3. Number six, Assassin's Creed Revelations. Number seven, Assassin's Creed Unity. And number eight, Assassin's Creed 1. While a lot of the systems and mechanics don't quite connect to each other much like AC1, it does still actually feel like a game for the most part, and I did enjoy the story throughout when it came to Arno and Elise's relationship. So there you go, the game that's touted as the worst one, honestly, not as bad as I think people say it is, and the reason people say it's a bad game is not the actual reason of why it's not a standout in the series. So if this is the Assassin's Creed 1 of the PS4 and Xbox One generation, what does that make this next game? Let's talk about... Some fun facts for you, Assassin's Creed Syndicate was released on October 23rd, 2015 on PS4 and Xbox One and was developed by Ubisoft Quebec. So it's now the second time that we've seen a studio other than Montreal take the reins on a major AC game. And a slightly fun fact, I can't find finalized numbers anywhere, but this is one of the least successful games sales-wise in the series. In the UK, it had only beat Rogue's first week sales numbers in its first week of launch, and as of February 2016, it had only sold 4 0.12 million units worldwide, which does feel pretty low for a AAA series like Assassin's Creed, a AAA third-party series. This is the game that suffered from Assassin's Creed fatigue. We had not one, but two Assassin's Creed games the year before, one getting a lot of backlash from the fans, and the other no one was really talking about. So there wasn't really a whole lot of talk about this game. People weren't playing it because they were tired of Assassin's Creed. And as many of you know, this would be the last traditional Assassin's Creed game in the franchise with a focus on stealth and assassinations, parkouring, animation-based combat, only light RPG elements, etc. And it seems like this was the last one to focus on all of that because Ubisoft knew that fans were becoming uninterested and it was showing in the sales numbers and they knew they had to change things up soon. Even for me, this is the only main Assassin's Creed release I hadn't beaten before replaying the series this year. I looked back at my trophies and I got like two thirds of the way through the story and then just dipped. Probably because it wasn't hitting me at the time and also probably because Fallout 4 had come out a few weeks afterwards and this was at a time where I would play video games at a leisurely pace and not binge them like I do all the time now. But let me tell y'all, despite all of that, this is the hidden gem of the series. Keeping on with my analogy that AC Unity was the AC1 for PS4 and Xbox One, Syndicate is the AC2 and AC Brotherhood for these consoles. It takes all of the ideas from Unity that were good on paper but didn't come together super well and ties it all together so well to make for such a fun open world game. It takes place during the Industrial Revolution in London, making it the most modern AC game to date and y'all, I don't even know where to begin with this one. I guess we can start with the story here because I think the simple but well told story helps set up the gameplay in an important way. You play as Jacob and Evie Fry, twins who are the children of a master assassin who are stationed in Crawley who decide to go to London to take the city back from the Templars and locate another piece of Eden, this time being a, a shroud that can heal its wearer, which is kind of cool that we're getting something different other than just the apples that can control people. The plot is so simply set up. You're two assassins and you're going after Crawford Sterrick, the Grand Master of the London Templars, and you're going after him one area at a time. The medicine markets, politics, banks, you're just slowly chipping away at the power this man has until you can get access to him directly. 
and because of that simple premise, it allows for smaller stories and character moments to stand out. There's a whole chapter where one of Steric's men, Maxwell Roth, the head of the Blighter Gang, helps you out because he's sick of working for Steric, and this interesting relationship builds between him and Jacob. Eventually, you have to kill him because he doesn't see how fucked up it is to kill children who are working in Steric factories, and the breaking of their friendship just builds this complicated and interesting relationship so well. One of Roth's last line before he dies is, Keep the world in its divine, manic state. For the same reason, i do anything. Why not? <laughs> and then proceeds to kiss Jacob. He's just this well-developed, interesting antagonist who's only in the game for a very short amount of time. Like, he's not even the main villain, but he will forever stand out to me as one of the best in the series. He was Jacob Fry's Joker, in a sense. Holy shit. You're just Batman in this game. This is just a Batman game. No wonder why I like it so much. Anyways, there's so much story-wise in this game that I love. How Jacob and Evie are very different in how they see taking back London, which eventually causes them to possibly never work with each other again because they're both so hard-headed. Evie and Henry Green's relationship, the handling of historical characters, which honestly hasn't been this good to me since AC2 and Brotherhood, because this game really brings so many characters to the front row. You've got Charles Dickens, Charles Darwin, Alexander Graham Bell, Florence Nightingale, and motherfucking Queen Victoria. They all make for some really fun moments with the characters you play as, and I just adored it. And dude, Jacob and Evie's story ends with them getting knighted by the Queen, and it's just one of the coolest moments in the series. Of course, even with how different the twins are and the major fight they have near the end of the game, I thought their relationship was great and very real between a brother and sister, and because of that, it makes it even more heartwarming when they move past their differences and their father's expectations of them to work together again and keep their competitive sibling relationship going. Honestly, through and through, beginning, middle, and end, I think this is the best told story in the series. It had me grinning so many times and actually made me emotional when the game was trying to. And holy shit, I haven't even talked about the minor story stuff yet, okay? So modern stuff, while still being majorly pushed aside, does some cool character stuff with Sean Hastings, one of the characters from the earlier games, and got me back into caring a little bit more about what's actually going on in that storyline. Also, there's an entire mission centered around Edward Kenway that I love a lot where you go to his home in London after the events of Black Flag. But the more important side story is the World War One side game that's just casually in this game. You jump into a glitch in London and it takes you to war-torn London where you play as Jacob's granddaughter in 1916 and you help out Winston Churchill fight Germans, Templars, and another sage. This premise could have been an entirely different game on its own and feels like a major proof of content concept for an even more modern place Assassin's Creed game, I really dug it. So quick shout out to that part of the game, which feels essentially like an expansion and is just casually in the game. Now with the gameplay, moment to moment stuff just feels so much tighter overall in Syndicate. Fighting while still animation based feels way quicker and devastating if you read a situation with a group of blighters incorrectly. Parkouring doesn't feel as bogged down, keeping the dedicated up and down buttons, although I still had my fair share of frustrating moments with the game not knowing exactly what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go, which caused some major headaches every once in a while. But the key thing for this game is how London is organized into districts and we see the return of quote unquote enemy towers. Not so much towers anymore, but they're now activities like liberating children from factories, assassinating specific Templars, capturing major blighter criminals and turning them into the police. And yeah, there are still just enemy strongholds to take down. Mixing up the variety of what these activities are to liberate different areas of London makes such a fun and addicting loop that never feels like it overstays its welcome. And of course, you want to do them because they're fun in their own right, but because of that simple story premise, you're taking back London from the Templars, and these activities are directly a part of that. And it's also these activities, not just the story missions, that are tied to character levels, which feeds in even more motivation to level up both Jacob and Evie, experiment with different weapon loadouts, abilities, etc. Every major mechanic and system for this game just ebb and flow so well together. And to drive that point home, this was the first game in my 
my series replay that I actually cleared the entire map of enemy influence since Brotherhood. It just felt so damn satisfying and I honestly wanted more at the end of my playthrough. I would have loved to see more of this in the future of Assassin's Creed, but again, because of the dwindling interest in the series overall, no one really touched this one at launch, which encouraged Ubisoft to completely pivot and change what the series was about, which again, I do understand. But honestly, this is the game that I feel like the series had been building up to. It's the pinnacle of the classic style Assassin's Creed games, and I think more people need to go back and give it a true chance. With all of that said and done, I think the only place I can put this game is number one, right above Assassin's Creed Black Flag. So the current ranking as of right now is number one, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, number two, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, number three, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, number four, Assassin's Creed 2, number five, Assassin's Creed Rogue, number six, Assassin's Creed 3, number seven, Assassin's Creed Revelations, number eight, Assassin's Creed Unity, and number nine, Assassin's Creed 1. Honestly, this surprises even me, and I hope that drives home just how good this game is. It's above Black Flag, even with my heavy bias towards pirate stories. Please, seriously, play this game. I am at the very top of the order. But like I said before, this was the last installment in the franchise before Ubisoft changed the series up into a Witcher-style RPG. And this next game feels very fitting for a major changeup. Syndicate was the most modern-style Assassin's Creed that we have gotten, so it's only natural with a major change that we take the series back to the beginning of the Assassins. Let's talk about... Some facts for you about the first entry in the series that truly shook up the AC formula, Origins released on October 27th, 2017, marking the first time since AC2 that Assassin's Creed took a year off since there was no major release in 2016. Again, this was at the point where people were getting tired of the same old Assassin's Creed formula. Unity was hated, Syndicate was ignored, so Ubisoft kind of planned the release of this game perfectly uh, to come out and bring back interest and excitement for the first franchise. And a fun personal story for you here, this was the first Assassin's Creed to release when I was actually in the games industry, having been hired by IGN a year beforehand, and I think to this day it is the only review event I have been to. Uh, like, you, you know, we've I've been to plenty of preview events and stuff, uh, but yeah, I was, I was sent to the review event. Uh, our reviewer went, I think that was reviewed by Alana Pierce at the time. And then I went to capture just a bunch of gameplay because that's what my job was at IGN. And uh, I think we had like a Wikis person there. Shout out to JR from the uh, Wikis team who I think was with us. So yeah, I had to like binge through the game in like four days to capture everything in the story. And I remember we had to play it on an Xbox One X, which is like why they had a review event and like not just sent us codes because they wanted us to play it on a One X because that was the year the One X and PS4 Pro came out. And uh, I don't think One Xs had been sent out for review by Microsoft. So instead of just sending us a review code, we had to go to an event. So yeah, I, I remember I remember doing that and it was, it was really fun. It was seriously like just my job to play Assassin's Creed from nine to five for an entire week. And uh, honestly, that was kind of cool. And yeah, honestly, like I fell in love with the game uh, during that time, but I have not touched it significantly since my replay of it this last year. So of course, this was the first game to make major changes to Assassin's Creed, and not just the small steps we saw in Unity and Syndicate. While parkouring is still in this game to the extent of being able to climb on a bunch of shit, it takes way more of a backseat. It's a more open world RPG very akin to The Witcher 3. Origins is set in ancient Egypt during the time of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy the 13th, and focuses on the journey of Bayek and Aya, a married couple who seek revenge for the death of their son. So I kind of want to focus on gameplay and world design and pacing first because I'm actually really impressed by how well it held up to me. One of the things I remember from Odyssey is that level grinding felt like a slog and that there were major jumps in the minimum level you would have to be to survive the next story mission. So I was kind of worried that now I was getting into Origins, which was the first AC game to really put a major focus on character and enemy level. Just to compare, the level cap I believe in Syndicate was level 10, and in Origins, for the base game at least, not including the DLC, the level cap was 40. So the game is really trying to encourage you to explore a lot, grind out your levels, do side missions, take out enemy camps, etc. And I was worried it was going to feel at odds this time around with the story, but to my surprise, my level and equipment progression
progression felt very natural and smooth, and it never felt like I came to a major halt. It was always like entering a new town at like level 20, the next main mission you should probably be like level 21, level 22, but here are some side missions that help build the story of this town and are interesting in their own right that are level 20. And boom, the next thing I know, I'm already on my way to the next major area for the next assassination, and I'm level 25. And I really appreciated that from a gameplay perspective and a storytelling perspective. Like naturally, Bayek would want to help others on smaller requests because he's the last Magi and naturally wants to help people and enjoys meeting new faces or helping old friends or finds amusement in shady characters trying to use them for their own gain only to get nothing in the end. I felt a real relationship with Bayek in Egypt and that's not something I think I've really felt since the Ezio days of really feeling the connection between your character and the world. Also, we can't skip over the combat because it's so different. It's no longer animation based like most of the series, but hitbox based more like, do I dare say it? Dark Souls. I'm not saying it's hard like Dark Souls, I'm just trying to give you an example of what the moment to moment combat roughly feels like. And something that I was also surprised by was how much the combat held up. It was heartbreaking for me to try to go back to Witcher 3 after a few years and experience how clunky it feels today in comparison to games similar to it that have come out since then. And I had that in mind going into this one and was scared I was going to feel the same way for Origins, but I still enjoy it. Naturally, there's some clunkiness and weirdness every once in a while, depending on where you're fighting Fighting, but it always felt fun to fight a Phylake or a named boss or to go into the battle arena, which was such a cool and fun idea for this game. And although this game adds a lot more focus on combat, the stealth is still there and to me as fun as ever. Especially when you have a predator bow that you like, taking down camps with that and your blade is some of the most fun I've had with an open world Ubisoft game where you take down a bunch of enemy camps. You get into a rhythm because you know if you really wanted to, you could kill everyone while doing the camp objective and not be seen at all. It's funny when people cite the more recent AC games as non-Assassin's Creed, because Origins is one of the few games where I actually feel like a capable assassin, with so much control and variance on how I want to take people down. I know I said Syndicate was what the older ACs were building towards, but they were also trying to build towards this in a way too, and I absolutely love it. But again, shout out to the bows in this game, especially the Predator bows, which were so OP, and from what I remember were nerfed in Odyssey, and I'm bummed, and I already missed them. But then spoilers, they kind of come back in Valhalla, although still not as OP, but they're still really fun. One thing I want to mention is something I've seen from people hitting me up on Twitter as I update where I'm at in the series, which is a lot of the AC games feeling structured around a pay to win scenario, where you can pay for resources that you need to upgrade weapons or yourself. A lot of your major weapon and health upgrades are tied to resources you have to collect around the world, but in the store, there are time savers where you can pay like five or six bucks to get a bunch of these resources immediately. Time savers are so weird to me. Beforehand in the series, it, it kind of just felt like it, they're there. If that's how you want to play the game, that's up to you. But it was really here with Origins where I finally saw a game in the franchise try to be designed around encouraging you to go over to the store to uh, get time savers and all of the stuff. And it just felt weird to me. It, it doesn't take away my like overall enjoyment from the game, but it still stood out as a shitty practice from Ubisoft that I, I wish they would walk away from. I know they won't but I, I, I just wish like they would just develop a, a game around being a good game and not like the monetary side of it, you know? And lastly, this is something I wanted to add before diving into the story, is that while I enjoyed this style of open world for Assassin's Creed, I really do think the openness of it and the less structured loop as a follow-up to the very structured syndicate was a slight step backwards. I know it's kind of a preference thing here, but I still wanted to bring that up. Okay, now onto the story, which at the time of writing this, I feel slightly conflicted about. Let me gush about the story and then let's talk about some of the things that could have been afterwards. From the story we got, at its core, it's about a father trying to find closure in the death of his son. He goes on a quest to kill the people responsible, realizes this group goes higher up than he could have imagined, finds everyone who is directly linked with his son's death, kills them, finds peace, and in the process, slowly realizes that his relationship with his wife is fading away. To me, it's the most human story told in an Assassin's Creed game so far, and although it's very subtle at first what the game is really about, when you realize it's about the slow death 
death of this marriage, it's really fucking sad and hits you to the core. And it's not done out of hatred or anything, they just realize that their paths are no longer the same and the only thing really holding them together after the death of Camus was the mission of killing the people responsible for it. And that last scene of Bayek and either together is seriously one of my favorite scenes in the franchise. The entire time leading up to that moment, I thought we were maybe building up to it, but wasn't entirely sure. But then when you get there, it's like, oh, fuck, they're actually doing this. And tackling such a nuanced and sore subject of what it means when you're no longer in love with the person you thought you were supposed to be in love with, again, I think at its core, it's the most human story in the franchise, and I adore it. And also, this scene is really great because we get the reveal of where the Assassin's logo came from, which I do understand the complaint of it being really cheesy, but I like how personal it became of being tied to Bayek and Aya's son. Now, when we look at all of the added layers on top top of that core story, there's a lot to love and a lot that's forgettable. Some of the major standout moments for me were the middle assassination missions. You go on with a scarab who deceives and befriends you before knocking you out and leaving you for dead in the middle of the desert and making his family realize who he really was and making them hate you for it. And the hyena who is also a parent who lost their child and is trying to find any way to bring them back. Origins does a very good job at humanizing the people you're going after, which is something the series struggles with often, making the villains interesting. It's unfortunate though that the ultimate villain, the main person who kind of leads the Order of the Ancients and was directly involved with the death of your son, is like the most forgettable background character in the entire series. When they reveal it, Bayek and I are like, I can't believe it was Flavius. We trusted him and fought alongside him. I remember thinking the first time I played it, who? All of that build up to seeing the assassination tree and waiting for the top to be revealed definitely felt wasted. But learning little things afterwards, like that Caesar is the father of understanding that all of the Templars referenced in the franchise is cool, and discovering that Aya was the one who orchestrated his death was super cool, and learning that Aya's statue is an AC2 and Brotherhood. And even though Bayek and Aya no longer really have each other, they both have their own hidden one space that they lead in different cities, and it's cool to see the first iteration of the Creed be born out of their journey and relationship. Also, really quick observation that I had this time around that I found really interesting the thematically, is that the assassins who were all about fighting for the freedom of the people were born in an era where Egypt was being gentrified and slightly controlled by Greece slash the Order of the Ancients, which is kind of a foil to the never-ending battle between the assassins and Templars, and I just wanted to say that I really appreciated that connection this time around. Anyway, the, at the time that I wrote this review, I'm recording later just to kind of peel the curtains back a little bit, uh, I, I wrote this review right after I, I beat Origins, I, I forget, like, exactly when, uh, but I'm recording this later. Um, a lot of shit has been coming out about Ubisoft in the last year. Sexual misconduct, one of the directors of this game stepping down from Valhalla and eventually being fired, I believe. Comparing a group fighting for the equality of marginalized groups to terrorists. And of course, the classic quote of women don't sell video games. We don't want women to be our protagonists, especially in Assassin's Creed. That's a loose quote, but you know what I'm talking about. Honestly, the list fucking goes on. The main thing I want to discuss that's tied directly to this game is I Aya, and how disappointing it is to know that she could have been a more vital role in the main story, but apparently women don't sell. Don't get me wrong, I still love what we got, but I can't help but think how much better it could have been if Aya was at the forefront of this story rather than Bayek, who is still pretty great, he's just not as interesting as Aya. Thankfully, the devs themselves have fought as much as they can against marketing or whoever makes those decisions or calls or whatever since this game to make playing as a female the entire time a choice you can make. Yubi has made a little progress, but there's still so much for them to do, and it sucks to hear we could have almost gotten that fully with Aya. Overall though, I absolutely adore this game. Yes, it's completely different gameplay-wise from its predecessors, but I think that's a positive for this title. The story I think is my favorite, even though it still has some letdowns here and there, which to be fair, most Assassin's Creed stories do, but I feel like this is one of the more personal stories in Assassin's Creed we've gotten to date. The gameplay loop is fun and addicting, it's also good that I still can't can't believe this wasn't followed up with a major sequel playing as Bayek or Aya. I know we've gotten DLC, but to me, these characters deserved another major story in the franchise. 
Anyways, I think even though this is my favorite story overall, and I do really like the change to a major RPG, I think I have to put this just under the number one spot at number two, right under Syndicate. It's kind of unfair to compare these two games to me because I think one is a culmination of years of learning and adapting and fine tuning, and the other is the first step to something really good with flaws here and there. Even though Origins has my favorite story thematically and character-wise, I think Syndicate is a tighter and better experience experience overall. And honestly, I'm, st I'm still surprising myself at this point. I would have guessed before all of this that Origins would be by far and away my number one and Syndicate would have been somewhere in the middle. So honestly, yeah, this list is becoming unpredictable even for me. So right now, the ranking is as follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Number two, Assassin's Creed Origins. Number three, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Number four, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number five, Assassin's Creed 2. Number six, Assassin's Creed Rogue. Number seven, Assassin's Creed 3. Number eight, Assassin's Creed Revelations. Number nine, Assassin's Creed Unity. And number 10, Assassin's Creed 1. I know I spent a lot of time with this one, so I'll be quick to move on to the next game. This one just changed so much in the franchise that it was hard to condense my thoughts all down. Anyways, let's go even further back to before the origins of the Assassins. Let's talk about... Some facts for you about AC Odyssey, it was released on October 5th, 2018 for Xbox One, PS4, and weirdly enough, the Nintendo Switch in Japan, but you had to play it through the cloud. A very weird choice to test something like that out, but I'm sure Ubisoft just wanted to get some sort of test out there of uh, cloud streaming to a console. It's just interesting to me that it was the Switch and only the Switch in Japan. It's just an interesting move. And while I don't have a fun fact for you here, an anecdote that I have, uh, that while I was working at IGN, this game came out, and you know, the, the one of the big uh, selling points, you can play as either Cassandra or Alexios, male or female, whatever you want. And I remember uh, my uh, coworker and I, Mark Medina, were both assigned to uh, capture gameplay for AC Odyssey for game gameplay clips, features, etc. And we decided it would probably be best if one of us played as Cassandra and one of us played as Alexios, just in case we wanted to get some uh, videos of differences between the two playthroughs. And we both wanted to play as Cassandra. So we had to decide who got to play as who. And we decided in a one game of rock, paper, scissors. And let me tell you, I was so relieved when I chose scissors and Mark Medina chose paper and I got to play as Cassandra. I still feel bad for Mark for having to stick with his very aggro Alexios in his first playthrough. Uh, so shout out to Mark. I can only imagine how much that affected uh, his enjoyment of the game, but uh, much love to you, Mark. You, you, you stuck it out. <laughs> Now, for Odyssey, I think I want to begin with the gameplay and overall design of the game. Because, of course, many people out there, like your Greg Millers, have said to me so many times that before Odyssey, Assassin's Creed never really grabbed them, and that Odyssey is their favorite game in the series with how much there is to do, how big and beautiful the world is, etc. And if you follow me on Twitter or have listened to me on any show where I talk Assassin's Creed, you know that Odyssey isn't my favorite, and I've always had a tough time explaining why Odyssey doesn't work as much for me. I want to be clear. I do think this is a good game overall. There are some issues I have with how a lot of the major systems in the game all connect together. It's messy, and not because you can unlock a no-fall damage perk or that you can have supernatural abilities, which people have actually complained about. Those things make sense to me, and I'll share why later. There are a lot of systems that feel stretched out, and because of that, it doesn't all fit together. First, I want to say that the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in Odyssey is very similar to Origins, but with new additions and balancing choices made like being able to map unlockable abilities to utilize on your face buttons during stealth and combat. Bows are no longer OP, like some are in Origins. Fucking rest in peace. And because the story takes place before the Age of Assassins, your character, who is a mercenary in ancient Greece during the Peloponnesian War, is designed with combat in mind first and stealth and assassinating second, which did get 
tiring for me. I was really missing being able to assassinate people without the thought of trying to level up my assassination damage. Because no matter what, anyone you're trying to take down that isn't just a random grunt, you'll have to take on in a straight up fight or sneak away and repeat the process of sneaking up on them again, depending on how many enemies you have coming after you. Not to say the combat itself isn't fun, it is. Using the hero striker overpower attacks to wipe away a significant chunk to significant enemies was always satisfying. It all just felt repetitive after a while, with no major enemy standing out more than another gameplay-wise because they all felt the same. And that repetitive feeling really sticks out considering just how long this game is. And here's where we get to my first major problem. Obviously, Origins was the first game in the franchise to go the Witcher 3 route of open world design, side quests, leveling your character, the works. And like I believe I said before, it all felt natural to me. Side missions to level up Bayek a level or two always felt natural because of his role in Egypt. You never felt stuck for long if you wanted to get leveled for the next story mission, etc. And I think a lot of that is because Origins felt like a diet witcher in a very good way that doesn't feel bloated like Witcher 3 felt to me at times. Odyssey feels like Witcher 3 on steroids. The map is huge, there are so, 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 so many activities that feel way too repetitive that are almost required to get through the story, side missions that make the game feel way too bloated, the grinding and leveling system in the game feels way off compared to Origins, and how much gear there is in this game. Although I do appreciate being able to keep your cosmetic look while changing armor. I don't think that was available the last time I played this when it originally came out. So doing it this playthrough, that, that was cool. Straight up, playing on normal. There is a story mission where you finally find your mom as an adult and it's recommended level 23. I think there might be like one mission after that where you do some other side stuff with her. And then at the end of that, like kind of little story quest on the islands that you find her on, she's like, oh, let's meet up back at home. We're going to finally go home and we're going to try to resolve this as, as mother and in my case, daughter. And that next story mission, there's like two story missions, 20, both level 23, I believe. And then the next story mission where you have to go out and find your mom uh, back home is level 30. I remember being furious the first time I played this game and hitting that. What, seriously, what led to that decision? Was it because they realized they put in so many optional things to do that all kind of felt like the same thing over and over again? So maybe people naturally wouldn't want to do those side things anymore, so they force you to go do it with this huge level gap? Is it because purchasable time savers have been a thing since Unity and they wanted to force people to maybe look at buying the permanent XP boost so they wouldn't have to spend so much time grinding? I don't know, either way, it feels so unnatural, brings in this weird, abrupt halt to the story, and it was honestly fucking annoying. And to be upfront, for the second playthrough, I did get the permanent XP boost uh, for my replay of this game, because I remembered, I like went back into my memory bank when I started AC Odyssey, and I was like, oh, right. That's a thing. So I wanted to say I at least beat this game for the in review. So yeah, I got the permanent XP boost so I wouldn't have to grind for seven levels, which d did take forever uh, in my original playthrough and just be tired, d just so tired. I would have given up if I had to do it again. Now, my last major gripe has to do with both the structure of some of the systems in this game and the relationship to the story. Some of you know that the story in Odyssey has three major storylines to go through. The main story, which when finished is considered the end of your character story, is the family story. Your family all got separated because of the cult of Cosmos, and your mission is to get them all back together again. You have the choice to kill or save members, resulting in different endings, which I do enjoy that there's a small slice of agency and choice in this game. You can save your entire family and have them be lieutenants on your ship, kill a select few, or I believe abandon your family entirely, which I think is the bad ending. I haven't gotten that ending though, so I, I'm not completely sure. And let me say for this playthrough, I worked specifically to get to the good ending because I did kill a family member or two on my first playthrough. I thought maybe the good ending would feel much more satisfying to me this time around than in my first playthrough, but it didn't. Well, at least the family is all together. I'll get more wine. The game just kind of ends with no feeling of satisfaction for me personally, and nothing else major that was introduced felt resolved. And that's because the two other major storylines are treated almost as side missions that eventually lead to the more satisfying endings that I would have wanted to see naturally resolved in what Ubisoft might consider to be the main story with Cassandra and her family. You have the Cult of Cosmos and the Gates of Atlantis, both of which set up storylines that have really interesting ties to the lore previously 
reintroduce in Assassin's Creed. The cult seems to be a predecessor to the Order of Ancients slash Templars, which really quick, I appreciate that Origins is about the origins of the Assassins and Odyssey. It's kind of like the origins of the Templars. And the Gates of Atlantis connect to the first civilization stuff in really cool ways. To focus on the cult first, they're the big bad of the game that stole and raised your sibling to make them believe they're destined to rule the world. And it's your job to either rid your sibling of this world or bring them back to sanity. They're presented as the big bad, but once we get introduced to the cult menu, where you can track down each member of the cult through clues we find through the world, we see that there's one person in the center of it all pulling all of the strings. And to be able to reveal who they are and find out why they run this group, we have to grind all the way to level cap, which in the base game is 50, to be able to defeat everyone to uncover their identity. Then we finally find out that the true leader of the cult was Aspasia, the wife of Pericles. And it's a cool ending for this questline to finally find out who was in charge and learn that although she was in control at the start, the rest of the members started to overpower her rule and the cult quickly became chaotic and pointless the more its members were corrupted by personal gain. And then over on the Gates of Atlantis questline, we go off to fight mythical creatures like Medusa and a Minotaur to collect pieces of Eden to unlock the gates to Atlantis. And personally, I thought this was a really cool way to tie Greek mythology to the first civilization lore that has been built up in the series. Here we also meet your character's true father, which explains that you have blood very closely tied to the first civilization, which is why your character having crazy abilities doesn't bother me in a lore sense, because this is the closest we've ever gotten to your character being a direct descendant of the first civilization. And it all ends with your modern day character, Layla, who was introduced in Origins, and I realized I didn't introduce her when I talked about Origins. That shows how much the modern day stuff is really important. Waking up from the Animus, finding the gates of Atlantis herself, and running into your character who was still alive because they never parted with the staff of Hermes. And it's honestly one of the coolest moments in the series since the Who is Desmond? moment, and it's totally fucking locked behind all of this extra shit you have to seek out. And here's where we get to my problem with these actually really cool, real endings. This game does the exact same thing Arkham Knight did. The quote-unquote ending of Arkham Knight is technically that scene in Arkham Asylum, which ends kind of abruptly. But to get the true satisfying endings that give you actual closure, you have to complete all of the side missions. It's one of my few problems with Arkham Knight. They do the same shit here. The ending that actually feels like an ending is locked behind all of this extra shit that requires you to level grind first before you can even think about doing it. It's like finishing Arkham Knight, but you still have to get half of the Riddler trophies before getting the real ending, but this time you have to level grind before getting certain Riddler trophies. If that thought doesn't annoy you, you have patience that I will never understand and I applaud you. It feels like they had too many ideas of where to end the story and said, fuck it, we'll put in all of them, but you gotta put in real work to get to the satisfying one. They put in busy work just for the sake of busy work. It would have been so much cooler to have the Aspasia reveal and the Atlantis story fit naturally with the rest of the game. But to me, it just doesn't. At the end of the day, though, these decisions to structure the game this way to justify how much you have to do aren't straight up bad. There are just a lot of forced decisions that don't work for me personally, and the activities you're forced to do for hours and hours and hours on end to level grind become majorly repetitive. The best analogy that I can think of is that Origins was a really solid meal that had some fat and some hard to chew places here and there, but at the end was overall satisfying. Odyssey is a bigger meal, but it is only bigger because there's so much more fat that you have to chew through, and by the end you are exhausted. I know I've gone on long enough with this game already. I know we're already so close to the end of this in review, so I'll, I'll go through my next points as quickly as possible, which are more on the positive side. I just think I needed more time to properly explain from my perspective why this game has solid systems on their own, but when forced together, it makes a complete jumbled mess. And I haven't been really able to express that in a way that makes sense to anybody until now. So so sorry that I had to kind of drag y'all through that, but I, I finally figured out the way to explain it to people of why this, a lot of this game does not work for me. But going back, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is fun, and I do like a lot of the activities in here, despite them feeling stale after a while, because this game is so long. Choosing who to fight for in epic battles between Athens and Sparta is really fun, and unlike anything we've really experienced in an Assassin's Creed game before. The mercenary ranking is a cool idea that does make me want to take the top spot out, but like a lot of this game, feels too big eventually. 
actually. I did like Cassandra's family story more this time around. It just eventually fell into the hole other AC games did, where half of it just didn't stand out to me. There were too many people and little storylines to remember. All those smaller story moments like Phoebe's death and the whole Olympic subplot stood out to me more this time around as really good moments that are unfortunately buried in a lot of bloat. And like most AC games, I love being able to be friends with historical figures like Pericles and Socrates, and even some of the characters who end up being your close friends that I didn't recognize from books, I did really enjoy the relationship you build with them. So I think after everything that's been said, and after probably making a lot of people upset with some of my takeaways with this game, I will say I did enjoy it much more my second time through, but the things that really stood out to me the first time stood out even more. Like on the ground level, moment to moment, I like it more, but structurally, I think I like it less. And after a lot of thought of where to put this game, I think I have to put it at number six below AC2 and above Assassin's Creed Rogue. Because it is a really good game surrounded by what I believe are all mostly good to great games. I just think the games above it nail what they're trying to do more so than Odyssey does. Because of everything Odyssey tries to do, it ends up feeling like a very bloated jack of all trades, but a master of none. So as of right now, before we talk about our last game in Assassin's Creed in review, the ranking is as follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Number two, Assassin's Creed Origins. Number three, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Number four, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number five, Assassin's Creed 2, number 6, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, number 7, Assassin's Creed Rogue, number 8, Assassin's Creed 3, number 9, Assassin's Creed Revelations, number 10, Assassin's Creed Unity, and number 11, Assassin's Creed one. And there we have it. We've gotten through all of the previously released major Assassin's Creed games. We've got the newest release to review and rank, but just as a warning, I will be diving into spoilers just as much as I feel the need to, like I have with these other games. So if you hadn't had the chance to play Valhalla because of all of the next-gen launch madness and don't want to be spoiled, bookmark this video and come back to it once you've beaten it. Because with a series like this and a video that is this in-depth, it'll be hard for me to compare and review this game without talking spoilers. And I know this video video isn't coming out until a couple months after, but you know, it's still a recent game, so I just want to be careful. Anyways, let's finally wrap up Assassin's Creed in review with the most recent installment in the franchise. Let's talk about... Facts for you about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it was released on November 10th on PC, PS4, Xbox One, Xbox Series S and X, Stadia, and Luna, and then released on November 12th on PS5, since the PS5 didn't come out until two days after uh, the November 10th release date. And to give context where I played it, my first 40-ish hours were spent on a PS4 Pro, because uh, we had gotten codes for this game before uh, the PS5 had launched, so that's where I played it for the first half, and then roughly the last 30-ish hours of the game I played on PS5. And like I've said before, I don't usually focus a lot on performance with consoles and all that stuff, uh, but before we get into it, I really just want to shout out Next Gen in general. I thought this game was already very pretty on the PS4 Pro, but when I switched over and upgraded to the PS5 version, seriously, the getting the better picture quality quality in 60 frames per second with those loading times. Seriously, my 40-ish hours on the PS4 Pro might have been realistically like 45 hours with all the loading times and loading screens I had to go through, whether it was fast traveling or loading up the game every time I turned it on. To have this huge game on next gen look so pretty, run as smooth as it does, and load that quickly, honestly, it blows my mind. That's just the general stuff, though. We will talk about some of the other performance stuff in this game once we get into the nitty gritty. But without further ado, let's get into the weeds one last time. So I want to actually start this one off talking about gameplay and design because I'm very fascinated with what Valhalla has done to actually improve upon what Origins and Odyssey both brought to the table. And straight off the bat, I'll say that I love most of the design of Valhalla despite the fact that it took me a little over 70 hours to beat. So why do I like Valhalla more in this sense when I talked about being tired with Odyssey near the end of my playthrough? I think to start the segment off, we have to go back to my analogy of Origins and Odyssey being meals. 
meals. Odyssey being the same meal as Origins, but with more fat to chew through. I think Valhalla is as big of a meal as Odyssey, but there's more meat to enjoy, and you feel satisfied when it's all said and done. And here's why I think that. Odyssey kept trying to justify its open world activities that all eventually blended into one another with the leveling system and tying specific missions to a specific character level, which admittedly other games have done as well in the series. Here in Valhalla, where you spend most of your time as Eivor of the Raven Clan, going to different kingdoms across England to forge alliances so your group of Vikings can live their new life comfortably, entire areas have a recommended level, which isn't new, but almost all activities in that area are actually under that recommended belt. There are exceptions, of course, but story missions in a kingdom don't even tell you what level you should be because they're all tied to that area recommendation level. So I believe there's more of a fluidity overall in this game, because I never felt that huge gap that existed in Odyssey, where one story mission was a level 22-23 mission, and the very next story mission was level 30. And before we get into the actual activities you're doing to level up and progress in the game, I want to talk about how much I really love this new leveling system. Now, of course, when you first jump in at level 0 and see areas at 280 and 340, you probably naturally freaked out like I did because I immediately thought back to how much of a slog leveling was in Odyssey with the base level cap being 40 or 50. But your power isn't dependent on how many times you fill up your level bar and quote unquote level up, but how many skill points you spend. You get two skill points per level and the amount of experience you need to level up doesn't increase each time as far as I can tell. I believe in both Origins and Odyssey, the amount of XP you needed to level up would increase each level. And with Valhalla, and trust me, I paid as much attention to this as I could, the XP for each level either didn't increase at all or was so insignificant over an amount of time that it was impossible to notice, which made grinding not really feel like a grind during the story. For most of my time in the first two thirds of the game, I was entering new areas around 10 levels above the recommended level and usually leaving each area with a green signifier telling me that most enemies in this area could now be very easily killed. It all just felt smooth, even more so than Origins to me. But to actually talk about the skill tree where you're spending your points, it's no longer straightforward like in Origins and Odyssey, where you see all of the skills that you can unlock right away, but instead you have this almost massive map where you don't see everything right away and you're not unlocking skills the entire time. Most of the time you're improving specific character stats like how much attack damage you output or stealth damage you can do, or improving the stats of a specific type of armor, whether that be raven, bear, or wolf related. And then you can unlock some cool skills that could help you out in specific spots. And it's interesting because I feel like a lot of people didn't really take to the style of skill tree, but I personally really enjoyed it. Not only because I felt like I was constantly growing in power, but I like that there was less focus on the skills themselves and more thought into just what overall play style you want. And because of that, I never felt like I was relying on one unlock skill over the other. There was more of a balance of what I needed or wanted to use in certain situations. Where I feel like in both Origins and Odyssey, I stuck with relying on a specific specific skill or two, never feeling the need to venture outside of that. But why I really love the variance in how you can build Eivor in this game is the refocus on classic stealth in the series. Like I said earlier, Odyssey and Origins to an extent as well felt way more focused on combat because of the style of Assassin's Creed games had changed, but also because of who those playable characters were in those worlds. And I love that we the player get more of a say this time in how we want Eivor to take on England. Even the fact that one-hit assassinations were brought back, albeit behind a quick time event, made so much of a difference into how I played out a bunch of scenarios. No more assassinating just to take out a chunk of health, only to hide and repeat the process, or just straight up fight. There seemed to be this desire from the devs to kind of marry more of the original Assassin's Creed design into the newer games, and I honestly think they succeeded. Purely on a gameplay level, with the optional refocus on stealth and how they do that, I think Valhalla is the most Assassin's Creedy of the new RPG games. But of course, with this being a game primarily about being a fucking viking and raiding and killing a fuck ton of people, there's also a lot on the combat side of things which has been hard for me to nail down why I like it so much when neither Origins nor Odyssey really had anything I would write home about. While Valhalla sticks to overall the main conventions to the previous two games, there's something much quicker and just completely more violent this time around. It honestly strikes me as the new AC RPG equivalent to Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Both games combat 
combat systems are fast paced and open themselves to a bunch of gory takedowns that make my body hurt just looking at. And again, not feeling the need to rely on one specific combat skill I found in the world was really refreshing because for the first time in a while, I actually felt encouraged to use my full arsenal of special combat moves to fight my way through normal and boss enemies alike. And the last thing I want to shout out relating to combat, the combat moves that are linked to a special meter that you use on your face button, similar to Odyssey, aren't unlocked through the skill tree, but you actually have to find them throughout the world in these books. Again, I think it puts a lot of focus on how you want to build your character overall rather than relying on specific moves. Now, I want to quickly shout out some other gameplay things I loved before moving on to some other things I did not love as much. I know I've already taken a lot of time, but let's just get through it. I love that they brought back the settlement system that we've seen in games like Black Flag and AC2 and Brotherhood. Again, it gives more motivation to explore and collect resources to improve the lives of your clan. Although, once I got to level 5 with my camp, the places I had left to build didn't feel quite as important, which left the motivation to upgrade my entire camp slightly wanting. But another thing I really love is the gear system in this. Gone is the way of finding the same exact kind of gear just at a higher level way too often, but now there are more focused sets that you can have for the entire game that you upgrade throughout by finding resources and not having them tied to levels, which made upgrading in Origins and Odyssey a fucking chore and made it easier to just put on new gear. It made it much more personal for me, and hitting gold and fully upgrading all of my mismatched gear felt so accomplishing near the end of my playthrough and was oddly reminiscent of finding cool armor sets back in AC2 and Brotherhood. And the last thing I want to shout out that I really liked were the side activities. Of course, there's the fun little things like Valhalla's interesting dice game, flighting, the drinking game, etc. But then there were also just a lot of little fun anecdotal stories that always range from funny to at least interesting in some way. Like some kids at my camp discovering what they believed to be a dog trapped in a well, only for me to discover it was actually a domesticated wolf who I then recruited to my camp and that I could actually summon in the middle of fights. There were things like that that paid off very nicely gameplay-wise, or just weird little stories like discovering a dead body that could speak because it wasn't properly rested, but then discovering a house nearby that had a secret passage underground that led me to a very alive person who was pretending to be the dead body's voice just to make a few bucks, or running into Cody Bellinger from the LA Dodgers and playing a fun baseball-like game with him and helping create the idea of baseball. <laughs> this world and the characters you come by are weird and fun as fuck. They almost always had a lasting impression on me and never overstayed their welcome. Whenever approaching a blue mark, I knew that 9 out of 10 times, I was only going on a nice 5 to 10 minute adventure. So I no longer felt scared of accidentally starting a side quest that opens up 5 other quests that are required to finish that first quest. Like the rest of this game, it felt breezy and refreshing. Now before we move on to the story, there are some downsides to the game. While I loved during my playthrough of the main quest that grinding never felt like grinding, that came to a halt after Eivor's main quest was finished. I was roughly level 280 at that point, and knowing there were still other interesting lore-heavy things to do, I felt motivated to try and get to those points, but they essentially felt locked behind the level cap, which I believe is 340. And while that was frustrating as hell because it took me back immediately to my thoughts around Odyssey's story being forcibly tied to frustrating leveling systems, it didn't sting as much here because I will go ahead and kind of spoil this, I was already very satisfied from the main story. So anything extra was just possible icing on the cake. And the last thing, while I have mostly shrugged off AC bugs as it ain't an AC game unless it has bugs, some of the performance stuff throughout my playthrough did start to feel frustrating. Nothing heavily in the parkouring or anything, but PS5 has some screen tearing that wasn't too upsetting, but still enough for me to get annoyed by it every once in a while. And just weird things happened often, like a mission not letting me prompt a specific thing, forcing me to restart the game and that mission to actually get through it. I don't have footage of it, but sometimes bushes would disappear whenever I would get close to them, which I, I could still hide in them, but since I couldn't actually like see where the bushes end, it would fuck up some of the things I was trying to do stealthily. Cause like I would assume I was still in the bush and then apparently I wasn't and then I'd get seen and then I had to fight like five dudes. This game honestly is riddled with bugs. But even with the amount of slight headaches that kind of piled up over time in my 70 hour playthrough, it didn't outweigh how much I was liking everything else in the game. Hopefully by the time this video is finally out, to give context, I'm writing this part of the video in November and I'm recording uh, today on November 30th. Most things will be patched, but yeah, I don't think an AC launch has been 
this buggy probably since Unity. But hey, there's an actual good game amongst the bugs, unlike Unity, which was very fine, but because of that, it made the bugs shine even brighter at launch. But now let's get into the story because holy shit, there is a lot to talk about here. Again, spoilers ahead if you haven't gotten to Valhalla with all the crazy next-gen launch and all that stuff. Maybe there's a time code ahead, who knows? I, I, Knowing me, I'll put a time code uh, saying like, all right, we're done talking about Valhalla spoilers. So if you're trying to avoid story stuff, uh, you can skip ahead. First off, let's do some quick premise stuff. You play as Eivor of the Raven Clan, who can be male or female. Neither really adds much, but just for context. I played as female Eivor just because I prefer her look and voice to male Eivor. Eivor and Sigurd, a close friend, almost brother, leave their home to make their own settlement in England and are simply trying to forge alliances in the surrounding kingdoms to not live in constant fear of being attacked. It's a simple premise, much like Syndicate, but for me, it was still a good motivator in the story to make me want to explore each and every kingdom for the protection of my clan. Now, before we get to the batshit crazy stuff and just some of the general stuff I really enjoy in this story, at the same time, we get introduced to Basim and Hytham, members of the Hidden Ones who are looking to rid England from the rule of the Order of the Ancients. Taking down the Order of the Ancients is definitely more of a side thing this time around compared to Odyssey and Origins, but again, I didn't mind it as much. Eivor sees Hytham as one of her own people, and her taking these people out is kind of more like a favor to him. It only becomes personal when, say, significant people from Eivor's life are revealed to be a part of it. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up now is because of its ties to gameplay, much like Odyssey, you don't take everyone out by the time the story ends. While a lot of the members I felt like I did naturally take down in the story, more so than Odyssey, there were still a few branches left and of course the father still left to uncover. And while yes, I do wish this system was completely integrated into the main story like Origins, again, it just feels like icing on the top and you can go after the rest of them if you want to, but you don't feel obvious obligated to. Although I do wish they didn't make it so obvious that the father was King Alfred. Like, I haven't uncovered him myself at the time of writing this, but it's pretty obvious. And again, with how much he's tied into the actual main story, I don't really know how much this part of the game really adds to the story here. I just wanted to get that point out of the way, as it is one of my slight disappointments I had with how it's tied to the grind. But again, at this point in the game, I was already satisfied with what I got. What did we get in the main story, you may ask? In my personal opinion, one that was really freaking rad. First up, I want to shout out the kingdoms because while the overall premise and plot of Eivor and Sigurd's journey is pretty simple, these shorter stories that were introduced in each kingdom you went to were the real prize of the game. Each kingdom honestly felt like its own season in a Valhalla TV show where we got to spend time with these smaller side characters that for the most part were all very interesting to dig into. Whether it was finding the traitor in the inner circle of a kingdom, which for my end result still had me guessing if I made the right choice, helping a Dane-Saxon marriage being seen to the end, or visiting a childhood friend who's not ready to see his father die and take charge in his kingdom. Again, much like Syndicate with the simple overall plot of this game, I think it lends itself to these meatier, shorter stories within the kingdoms that I fell in love with. I never thought I'd be so interested in Viking and Saxon politics and the cultural relationship between the two and the religions, but the writing of the characters, whether big or small, just always had me engaged. And I love that we were never just done with the characters in these kingdoms. They naturally came back into the story when it made sense. Like all of the kingdom leaders coming together to help Eivor rescue Sigurd from Folke, or helping Ivar and Chaelbert keep the peace in a kingdom after not seeing them for a couple dozen hours. I was psyched to see what these two dudes were up to and was devastated by the end of this chapter because of the ultimate demise of Chaelbert. And learning that Ivar was the one who actually killed killed him just so the fighting could begin, I don't know if I've ever been more emotionally invested in Assassin's Creed than at that point. I wanted Ivar dead right there and then, and was satisfied when I decided to not let that piece of shit into Valhalla for what he did to my boy. And while we're here, I don't know exactly what it is, but the player choice in Valhalla just feels more significant than it did in Odyssey. I didn't let Ivar into Valhalla and never told a soul for the rest of the game. I'm sure if I told either of his brothers that would have changed the game 
a little bit and led to another boss fight or two, but I love that I got that option to keep that secret because personally, I don't think Ivar deserved to go and I don't think it would have helped anyone if they knew I made that choice. I just thought that was really cool and I haven't felt story choice really stick with me like that in a very long time. And lastly, shout out to the relationship stuff that I think was slightly improved from Odyssey. I entered a relationship with Ranvi, Sigurd's wife, and it did feel emotionally significant even if it only had minor ties with the actual story. Still not a lot, but definitely more than what Odyssey offered with just hooking up with people. But okay y'all, let's get to the meat of this story. While you go off to win allegiances from kingdoms, Sigurd and Basim go off on a mysterious adventure, and when you finally meet back up with them, Sigurd is convinced that he is a god that has been reborn, and it's inflating his ego quite a bit. Through some betrayals, he is ordered by King Alfred to be the prisoner of Folke, a really twisted member of the Order of the Ancients who also believes Sigurd is a god. Quick shout out to Folke, another character that the writing did a very good job at making it easy to trust her, then hate her. She's definitely another stand out among what has been an overall lacking group of antagonists in the series. While all of this is happening, your clan seer is also helping you translate these visions you're getting, which essentially tells the story of Odin trying to escape his fate of being killed by a wolf at the beginning of Ragnarok, which introduces, again, kind of like Syndicate, this whole ass side game where you explore Asgard and Jotunheim as Odin and come across Thor, Freya, and end with fighting Loki's son Fenrir, a terrifying wolf. The thing that makes this more expansive and important than the World War I stuff in Syndicate, however, is that it's actually tied to the main plot. When going through the Asgard dream stuff in the moment, it was cool, but I wasn't sure if these were just weird dreams Eivor was having, or actual events that Eivor is somehow able to see. There was a mystery there that I was not expecting to be answered, but it was answered. When you rescue Sigurd, he no longer has an arm due to being tortured by Folke, and is in a very weird funk, still convinced he is a god. And the way my playthrough went out, I didn't do the final main quest until right after the final Asgard mission where you fight Fenrir. And it was right at the very end of the Fenrir fight when I started to see the similarities, and not just Odin taking the shape of Eivor. Then Sigurd and Eivor take a trip to a place Sigurd has seen in visions, and they find an Isu temple in what they believe is the entrance to Valhalla, and after a bunch of crazy shit, the pieces start to connect. Eivor, Sigurd, and Basim are the reincarnations of Odin, Tyr, and Loki, who in this AC lore interpretation were part of a specific group within the Isu, aka the ones who came before. And honestly, it was all mind blowing to me and I can't believe I didn't see it sooner. They do just enough to change the appearances in the Asgard dreams that I didn't put together that the correlating characters were the same models, just slightly changed here and there. And when you come out of the fake Valhalla after fighting Odin slash yourself in this weird personal struggle with who actually controls Eivor, which the way you have to finish that fight is pretty cool by unequipping your axe, which he has power over. And Basim just kind of comes out and says who you all are, and he's been looking for both you slash Odin and Sigurd slash Tyr to take revenge on the treatment of his children. It was just so fucking cool. I was just really impressed with how the overall narrative tied together with Eivor's story and how it connected to the larger AC lore. And in the end, where you stick Basim back into the machine, have one last talk with Sigurd, and return to Ravensthorpe as the new leader, I I thought it was a pretty cool ending, which again is why the whole extra level grinding at the end didn't bother me as much this time around because I was already given a satisfying end unlike I was in Odyssey. They knew the important story beats they wanted to tell and they knew when to deliver them. And the last thing I want to shout out before wrapping this all up because I know we've gone really long on this game is just how much cool shit this game does with the AC lore. Whether tying Norse mythology to the Isu or explaining how the tribe in AC3 had gotten a piece of Eden to open up that vault nearby which was seriously cool as fuck and I couldn't believe they actually went there. To make reference to AC3 and have it be cool, I don't know how they pulled it off and that's not the only tie to AC3. Honestly, shout out to the modern day stuff purely for the weird way they bring back Desmond, with Nolan North actually returning as the voice actor and explain what actually happened to him when he decided to risk his life for humanity. Layla, hello. You know me? Yes through the calculations I read here in the gray. And then how that led to Basim coming back and reconnecting with the assassins, I don't know. Like, there were cool moments in some of the modern day stuff with Origins and Odyssey, but I haven't felt this invested with this part of the narrative since AC Brotherhood with everything we got at the very end. It's a nice place to die, Eivor. Not everyone gets to choose. 
Honestly, to me, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is an absolute standout in the series. I think it actually evolved design choices from both Origins and Odyssey to overall make a really fun and engaging open world. It doesn't nail everything with the Order of the Ancients system not feeling super significant outside of a couple of characters, and the end game level grinding, and of course, how buggy the game can get. But I think this series is making steps towards the right direction with this newer RPG style in the series. And with the story, which was super super cinematic and went into some really weird and cool places, there were a lot of moments here that had me grinning and looking up more AC lore wiki things than I care to admit. And it gave me a lot of characters that I'll be thinking about for a long time, which is more than I can say about some of the other games. While I wish there were some more things fleshed out in the story, like maybe showing us when Sigurd started to believe he was a god, instead of not being with him for a while, and then out of nowhere he's got the ego of Kanye. Besides that, overall, I was in love with it. And with all of that said, it's finally time to rank Assassin's Creed Valhalla. To keep it short and sweet, since I went really long on that review again, I'm sorry, I think I want to rank it at number two, above Origins and below Syndicate. Like I said earlier, I think Valhalla is a major improvement on the RPG games, but it's hard to compare it with Syndicate, which I've said I believe is the culmination of the original AC style games. Valhalla is fantastic, but I do think it does stumble in some places where to me, Syndicate was what the franchise was building towards for so long from a pure gameplay and design perspective. So as of now, the final ranking for Assassin's Creed in review is as follows. Follows. Number one, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Number two, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Number three, Assassin's Creed Origins. Number four, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Number five, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Number six, Assassin's Creed 2. Number seven, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Number eight, Assassin's Creed Rogue. Number nine, Assassin's Creed 3. Number 10, Assassin's Creed Revelations. Number 11, Assassin's Creed Unity. And number 12, Assassin's Creed 1. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone joined with me today. All of the Assassin's Creed games reviewed and ranked. Now, as a reminder, these are just my opinions. This isn't like a definitive thing, like with Zelda in review. It's just based on personal taste and what hits right at the right time. So seriously, let me know in the comments below how you would personally rank the franchise. Uh, I, I feel like I'm less aware of how people would rank overall the Assassin's Creed games than I am like with Zelda. Like when I was doing Zelda, I knew like what would be hot takes and stuff. And I feel like the only hot take I really know of is that like, Odyssey is lower than I know like some other people would put it and Syndicate being number one like those that's all I really know so seriously I'm interested to see what y'all got so you know leave your ranking uh, down below and like why you rank certain games let's continue the conversation even after uh, this video is over. Now, before I wrap up this video and we all say goodbye after a very fun Assassin's Creed in review, there are two more things I want to rank before we all go our separate ways. And that is each protagonist and antagonist in the series. So rapid fire, let's rank the AC protagonists first, including the modern day characters. Number 13, Arno Dorian. Although I liked his story more this time around, he just isn't super memorable. He comes off as a wannabe Ezio and it just doesn't click. Number 12, Altair. He's a cool concept, but one of the weakest parts in his own game. Much cooler later on in the series though. Number 11, Layla. Although she was short-lived, Layla was an attempt to bring back focus to the modern day stuff, which for me did work in the end. I also like how crazy she was in Valhalla. Number 10, Jacob Fry. I like his relationships with others more than who he is himself. It's hard to rank him without Evie because they're a single unit to me. I did want to separate them for this ranking though. Number nine, Desmond Miles. Similar to Jacob, everything around Desmond to me was much more interesting than Desmond himself, although he was enough of a driving force to keep the modern day stuff engaging early on in the series. Number eight, Eivor of the Raven Clan. Again, kind of like the last two, Eivor felt the most in the series like an avatar to you and your decisions, but I did like the more pulled back performance, much like Connor from AC3, and of course the reveal of who Eivor truly is, is just really cool shit. Number seven, Connor Kenway. He was definitely a tonal shift from Ezio, but I do really like Connor's journey, how headstrong he is, and how little he puts up with other people's shit. Connor is a really cool protagonist. Number six, Cassandra. Spoilers, I'm not gonna rank Alexios in this one because I never played as him. I do like Cassandra though, and funny enough, she's the exact opposite of the last few people. I think she's a really fun character to journey along with. I just think the story she was given wasn't that great to really spring her to the top. Number five, 
Shay, Cormac. I think from here on are all winners. Shay is just overall one of the most interesting characters in the entire series. I know the selling point of Rogue was what if good man turned bad, but they actually pulled it off with Shay. Number four, Bayek of Siwa. I think he's a really strong character and his story is really well done. He's one of the few that left me actually wanting more of him. Number three, Evie Fry. She's a dope and strong woman. She doesn't take shit. She ain't afraid of going for it. She's what makes the Fry twins fun and interesting and you love to see it. Number two, Edward Kenway. I mean, come on. He's a pirate with a heart of gold that could have been played by Chris Hemsworth if a movie was ever made about it. What more do you want from me? Number one, Ezio Auditore. I mean, come on, could there be another answer? He's what made the Assassin's Creed franchise. He was the Assassin's Creed franchise for three entire games. Ezio Auditore, the OG motherfucker right here. There's no other choice for the number one spot. Now, a rapid fire ranking of the antagonists. Number 13, this dude from Unity. I still don't know his name. I have the resources to be able to look up his name, but I don't care enough to look up his name. Holy shit, I still don't know who this dude is. Number 12, Prince Samet. While I like the relationship between him and his nephew, he just doesn't really stand out amongst the rest. Number 11, Flavius, Caesar, and Cleopatra. I'm lumping these all together because they just don't stand out a lot. Flavius because he was the disappointing reveal of being the one directly tied to the death of your son. And by the time Caesar and Cleopatra kind of turn on you, you just feel kind of deflated because of the reveal of Flavius. So I, I don't really think they stand out too much as antagonists either. So I'm lumping them all in together. Number 10, Aspasia. She's the only one I would consider an antagonist here. And even in my playthrough, I, I, I let her go. And something I'm realizing now is another problem I have with Odyssey is that there's no real clear-cut villain. I guess your brother kind of too, who I guess I could lump in here, but yeah, number 10. Number 9, Warren Vidic. I have not talked about Warren Vidic at all in this interview, and that's also he doesn't stand out. He gives the modern day characters someone to face up against, and he, he is an interesting idea on paper, but I just don't think he was fully utilized well. Number 8, Bartholomew Roberts. Again, like I said earlier, I think he would have been a better antagonist if he was the clear villain in the entire story in Black Flag. But again, once we get to his reveal that he's the kind of the main villain, it's just like, oh, uh, all right. Number seven, Rodrigo Borgia. Like I said earlier, I don't think he's as interesting going back to after all of these years, but he is the reason for your family's death. He does become the Pope. There's significance there, but in the overall story of Assassin's Creed 2, again, I just, I don't think he really does much besides what he does at the very beginning of the game to really stand out. Number six, Crawford Sterick. He's a super simple villain, but again, I, I really liked what we got of him from his cutscenes when we check up on him after we take down territories, all that stuff. I just wish we got to see more of him and more interactions between him and Jacob and Evie. Number five, Cesare Borgia. He's a crazy motherfucker who likes kissing his sister and doing anything to gain power like trying to kill his dad. He killed your Uncle Mario, he burned down your home, and being able to take revenge by taking back the entirety of Rome from him was really, really fun. Number four, Achilles. Now Achilles is a weird one because he is kind of part of the good guys, but in Rogue, he has the most antagonist role in the game. And I do think because of the role he has in the assassins at the time and the way you butt heads with him in Rogue does make for some interesting conflict, especially since you start off as allies and become enemies. Number three, Bassem. Again, we don't have a clear-cut villain in Valhalla, but I think Bassem is the closest thing we have to that. And because of who he truly is and that reveal and how that connects to Eivor and Sigurd, I thought it was really cool and really interesting. And again, like the way he's connected to the Hidden Ones and the Assassins and how that all plays out, I just was really, really into. And I do really hope we get to see him in the future of Assassin's Creed. Number two, Al Mualim. He is the best thing about the first Assassin's Creed game, and he is the most most interesting thing about the first Assassin's Creed game. I think a lot of the important theme writing in that game was poured into him as a character, and I still think his reveal as the villain is one of the best in the series. Number one, Haytham Kenway. Honestly, I feel like he's the default best villain in the series because he's kind of the Darth Vader in the series in a weird sense. He's the father of the protagonist in Assassin's Creed 3, and he does give off this Darth Vader-esque vibe whenever he shows up as like an important villain. 
And I think because of that, that just kind of makes him the de facto number one here. I think overall, Assassin's Creed does have a villain problem. Like the top four on this list, I would say are like good and interesting, but no one that's like, holy shit, this is like a villain. This is really cool. So just get on it, Ubisoft, make better villains. It helps give the, the characters more motivation. And like in the case of Al Maulim, when they are interesting, they bring in a very interesting conversation about ideology. I just wish we had more of that, so um, please flush them out a little more. And after everything has been ranked, the games, the antagonists, protagonists, for my final words for AC in review, after playing through the series over the course of the last year, it's definitely been an interesting journey. It didn't have that satisfying feeling at the end that Zelda had for me. I think there was just more consistency throughout Zelda that made the Breath of the Wild end cap just really great. But with AC, there are so many ups and downs overall in the series and within each game themselves. There are some games I wish I hadn't replayed because it took away the rose-tinted glasses for them. But I guess there were some things that were still fun to revisit. And honestly, if there's anything to take away from this experience, Assassin's Creed is a fun series that's all over the place and I'll say, I could not have predicted this final ranking. If you had told me that Black Flag was not in the top two before all of this, or that AC2 didn't even break the top five, I would have called you a crazy person. Even with that though, I do really like this series with all of the memories I've made with it, and I'm excited to make more in the future, hopefully. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone join with me today. This has been Assassin's Creed in Review, a Kinda Funny Games in Review special where I, Barrett Courtney, played through the major Assassin's Creed games, reviewed each one, and ranked them all. Of course, I still encourage you to continue the conversation and share your rankings and why below. There are no wrong answers. I'm just honestly really interested to see what your takeaways from this series are. Because again, I made this in a silo, don't really know anybody's personal rankings, so please leave them in the comments below. Of course, if you want to follow me in my batshit crazy pursuits, like replaying a bunch of games in a franchise, you can follow me at SadboyBarrett on practically every social platform. I mainly just use Twitter, though. And of course, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe right here to Kinda Funny Games for all of our crazy and fun video content, like the Legend of Zelda in review I did last year. And of course, until next time... Requiescat in pace.